Welcome everybody to the uh, Scarborough Town Council Wednesday, May 16, 2018 regular meeting. Uh, I'll call the meeting to order and ask if you would rise with us uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Bayvine? Present. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor Caterina? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Piazzo? Here. Chairman Dunn? Here. Uh, general public comments. Anyone wishing to address the council on anything that is not on the agenda uh, tonight can have the opportunity to do so. State your name, address, uh, uh, three minutes, and the rules of decorum are recited right there in front of you. Thank you. Thank you, you uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, start by apologizing to Tommy Hall. Uh, my source uh, back in November had you mixed up with the manager who was paying his wife and uh, daughter's cell phone bill from Rockland Funds. I apologize. Uh, I've been in this area for over 70 years, just about. And I've been in Bruce Thurlow's house back when he was superintendent of schools in Cape Elizabeth almost 50 years ago. So I've known a lot of people in both Scarborough and Cape for a long time in, in the town of Falmouth where I live now. In the approximately 50 years I've been an adult, I don't think I've called for police services more than six times. And you have a chairman of this council, according to the records from Scarborough Police Department, has called, he and his wife have called for police services in Scarborough 92 times in less than 12 years. And the police officers who tell me about this consider that abuse of the police department. Apparently, there's some parking issue in Higgins Beach that Mr. Donovan calls about constantly. So I think the people in Scarborough should know that the chairman of this council, a retired lawyer from New Hampshire, living in this town about 12 years, has called for 92 times, he and his wife, for police service. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to address the council on anything not on the agenda? Please approach the podium. Uh, public uh, comment. Uh, just uh, minutes of April 25th, 2018, and May 2, 2018, regular town council meeting. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Corrections. Comments. If I, if I may, just please, can we divide that because I wasn't present for April 25th? Yes. Uh, we will deal with uh, uh, April 25th first. Uh, comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Uh, May 2nd. Uh, may I have a motion for that? So, so moved. Second. Comments? All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Adjustments to the agenda, none at this time. Items to be signed. I have signed the treasurer's warrant. Non action items. Presentation from the Maine Turnpike Authority regarding the Portland Area Mainline Study. And we have Bruce Van Oat from the Maine Turnpike Authority here with us this evening to make a presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Bruce Van Oat. I'm the Director of Policy Planning uh, at the Maine Turnpike Authority. I work for Peter Mills, which is actually in traffic on the way over here. So I'm, <laughs> I'm standing. So yeah, I don't think he's on the turnpike. I also... <laughs> I also happen to be a uh, member of the Topson Planning Board. The only reason I mention that is it brings two things to mind. One is to thank you for your public service, because that doesn't often get done, so I just thought I'd do that. And the other is to be extremely brief, because I know how much I appreciate that. So I'm just going to kick this off by saying we've been in the process of about a year-long process with a public advisory committee of 18 members, including your own uh, Mike Shaw, uh, deciding what to do with the Portland Area Main Line, which is to defined by basically mile 44 up to the Palmas Port 53. And uh, Paul Godfrey of HNDB is the head of our consultant team is going to make the presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good evening, folks. Uh, as Bruce said, we will do a very brief presentation, but essentially give you tonight an update uh, of a process that's been going on a little over a year called the Portland Area Mainline Study. Uh, tonight, we'd just like to update you on progress let you know where we've, where we've been and where we're going moving forward. 
Uh, if you look at the screen, just to give you some background as to, as to where we are, the Portland Area Main Line, I'm sure everybody knows it, but for our purposes of this study, uh, it's the area between Exit 44 in Scarborough and Exit 53 uh, in Falmouth. Again, as everybody knows, it's, it's the primary access if you're heading north on the Turnpike or heading out through Falmouth onto 295 and heading down east. This section of the Turnpike has multiple interchanges. It serves the greater Portland region, access to the Jetport, Main Mall, Unum, many other businesses and residential communities. Uh, for, uh, for the city of Portland, for this region, uh, it is the main trunk line. Again, it serves uh, a predominant purpose of both uh, uh, excuse me, uh, commuter traffic going to and from work every day, residential traffic going to uh, shopping in other areas, and also serves to, to carry people through the region uh, to other destinations. You may have heard in previous time that there has been discussions, I think we were here before you uh, a couple of years ago about a GORM connector. Tonight is not about that, <coughs> but we are just letting you know that that discussion is ongoing. Uh, we keep that discussion of a GORM connector in our windshield as we look at this study, uh, but it is something that is separate and not connected to tonight's discussion. We're here tonight to give you an update on the fact of why this study is occurring. Well, it's occurring because a problem has been identified. The problem that's been identified is that there are safety and mobility issues on this section of the main turnpike between exit 44 and 53 problems that are growing to the point where it has led to this study forming and this study occurring. <coughs> Traffic has been growing sizably on the main turnpike in the past four or five years, over 3% growth annually. Um, for those that are familiar with traffic growth, that is sizable for this region. We are also seeing crash rates that are high on this two-lane section of highway. As folks know, we have two lanes in each direction. The crash rate on this section is notably higher than it is on the section of the turnpike south of uh, exit 44, which is three lanes in each direction, even though that section carries more traffic. As some folks may be familiar with, during uh, peak periods in the morning and the evening, the road is nearing capacity. How do we know that? How do you know that? Traffic slows down. We see backups. We see brake lights come on as people are trying to get on. We see backups as, as people are entering the turnpike from the interchanges. Traffic volumes, as they continue to rise, raise anywhere from 34,000 vehicles a day to 52,000 vehicles a day, as indicated on the graphic. This, these numbers grow sizably, 20 to 25 percent during the summer when we have the influx of tourists and folks coming into the state to visit our great state. As we have looked at the problem, one of our ways of defining how bad the problem is, is looking at level of service. Um, level of service is like high school grades. If you can get an A, B, or a C, you're doing okay. If you're on D, it's marginal. If it's E or F, it's a problem. The graph we present in front of you today looks at both existing and future traffic conditions on the main turnpike today and into the future, no, um, um, specifically the, the year 2025 and the year 40. The items I'd like you to pay attention to are the red boxes. Today, as we look northbound during the evening rush hour, we have a couple of sections on the turnpike, spe specifically between exits 46, 47, and 47, 48, where we're at level of service E. We're nearing capacity. As we look at normal turnpike growth, in the next nine years, we see that that grows to at least four sections, between exit 45 and exit 52. By year 2040, we forecast that the entire turnpike section between 44 and 53 will be near or at capacity. As we look southbound, which uh, again typically peak times occur in the, in, in the morning, we see similar problems. Today we have a section that is, that is uh, undesirable, that grows to a, 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 a clump <coughs> of sections 3 from 48 down to fo uh, 46 uh, by 2025, and again by 2040 we have many sections that are, that are at capacity. What does this tell us? This tells us that left that left un, um, that if, if nothing is done, this problem will grow to where traffic going through this region will slow, it will stop, crash rates will increase, this will become a problem for those that are trying to drive through the region. As we've concluded, as we've shared with the Public Advisory Committee and as we are sharing with you this evening, the data that we have shows that by 2025 there will be significant problems on the turnpike. It is prudent to begin planning and identifying possible solutions now. Why do we do that? Solutions cannot happen overnight. 
Many solutions that we've identified could take years to implement. So again, given the fact that we are a handful of years away from a sizable problem, we are looking to plan that now. One of the things that we realize and folks absolutely recognize as they drive on the road, as sections of roadway become congested, it has a problem as it spills back to the, to the adjacent section. So again, this is why we are looking at addressing this problem as part of this study now. We have a, we've had a sizable public process throughout this, uh, this, this year-long study. Uh, as Bruce noted, we created a public advisory committee made up of members of communities, businesses, uh, transit providers, other folks who are very near and dear to understanding how important transportation is to the region. We've had four public advisory committee meetings to date, two in 2017 in June and October, and then two so far in 2018 in January and April. We have a final PAC meeting scheduled for June uh, next month to review uh, ongoing findings. As we always do at each PAC meeting, the public is invited to speak and, and provide comment. You folks are our first municipal meeting. We are planning to go to each of the municipalities through which the Turnpike passes in the study region. So we have upcoming municipal meetings with folks in June. We are also going to have a public open house June 7th at the main mall. Purpose is to try to get a broader input from folks who may be traveling through the region relative to our study and our analysis. Sole purpose of a public process is to allow the Turnpike Authority to get feedback. So any feedback you have this evening, any questions you may have, very helpful for us and the authority to understand what your concerns are moving forward. What alternatives have we evaluated? So with any study, it's our charge to look at different alternatives to solve and address the problem. In Maine, there's a law called the Sensible St Transportation Policy Act, STPA for short. It requires the authority to evaluate reasonable alternatives. What is a reasonable alternative? It's an, it's an alternative that addresses need, is cost effective, and can be implemented in a reasonable time. When we started this study, the study team had identified nine. Through the PAC process and through the public process, ten additional alternatives have been added and, are, and either have been evaluated or are currently be evaluated at this time. What are those wonderful list of 19 alternatives? They are on the screen. They fall into essentially three groups. TDM or transportation demand alternatives, alternatives such as uh, bus and rail and transit uh, and land use, ways that people will change their behavior such that it could reduce demand on the turnpike. TSM, or transportation system management, ways that we can better manage uh, and, 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 and direct the flow of traffic on the turnpike. We also have capacity alternatives, namely looking at widening the turnpike through this study area, or also looking at widening 295. We've also looked at combining some of the more promising alternatives. That's what those are, that, those are the ones that are being uh, evaluated now, the ones with the asterisk. So again, 19 alternatives being evaluated. <coughs> Findings to date, of the ones that have been evaluated to date, we've only found two that have fully met the study purpose. The study purpose is in the handout that you have in front of you on page two. Uh, those two alternatives are widen I-95 or implementation of what we call HOV and HOT, which are high occupancy vehicle, high occupancy toll lanes. The remaining uh, 11 alternatives partially meet study purpose, but they need help. Um, of the 11, several, several show promise to the regional transportation, but they only partially address the need on the turnpike. Many of these uh, uh, 11 also require additional support, either from municipalities, main DOT, uh, transit providers, or other regional partners. Widening the turnpike can be readily implement, implemented, so that is, a, that, a, that, is a, that is considered a reasonable alternative. The HOV, HOT lane, without going into a lengthy discussion, is challenging because currently Maine law does not, per, per, um, does not allow tolls to be surcharged, which is what HOT lanes are. Both alternatives were identified to be cost effective. That is our very fast forward through our alternatives analysis. Uh, the package in front of you uh, contains the study purpose. It contains a one to two page summary of all the alternatives we have evaluated. It also contains a copy of tonight's presentation should you wish to go back and take a look at that. At this time, we'd be happy to entertain any questions. If not, I'm sure Mike would be able to follow us, follow up with us afterwards if needed. Great. Counselors, uh, uh, questions? Do not have any extra Counselor Katerina. Um, 
I live in North Scarborough, and I know a lot of my neighbors watch these meetings. Um, what's going on with the connector? What's going on with the connector? <laughs> the bypass that will help, you know, hopefully alleviate traffic concerns here in Scarborough. I know I'm putting you on the spot. Oh, no, a but bit. Please, please put me on the spot. So, in terms of a priority, Addressing this problem first has been identified uh, the, the, the higher priority by the Turnpike Authority. Turnpike Authority is currently working with Army Corps of Engineers through the process so that they can define what alternatives will need to be evaluated moving forward. But um, without speaking for the authority, my understanding is the authority is looking to address this problem first and then uh, continue with the ongoing evaluation of a Gorm connector. So, so which problem? I mean, this, this the, 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 the addressing the problem on the main turnpike between exits 44 and 53. Right. Um, so, in other words, we're not going to see anything in my lifetime? Or? No. <laughs> so, I, uh, the study that we're presenting to you this evening is scheduled to be completed next month or, 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 or as late as July. Uh -huh. um, it is my understanding that the authority is going to continue to look to move forward with Gorham sometime thereafter, but okay. they also understand as a priority, uh, the legislature has, di has directed them to look right. at this, so I suspect that they will do that. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I think it would be uh, the view of several counselors that uh, to the extent that two priorities can be advanced simultaneously, that would be appreciated because I think <coughs> the Gorham Connector is perceived as a significant traffic issue for the town of Scarborough. Very Other good. questions? Yeah, could you talk a little bit about the HOV HOT lanes? Is that intended to be done without without the widening or in it by itself? Because that would only be one lane for correct. The, travel. The, the the basic assumption under the HOV HOT lane alternative is that you would build an, an additional lane, but that third lane would be dedicated to high occupancy vehicles or high occupancy toll vehicles, meaning people who are willing to pay a surcharge to travel in a lane that would likely be less congested. And, and the toll, you'd still have to have the high occupancy, but you'd just also be paying extra. That is correct. You would continue to pay the current toll. There would be an additional charge on top of that. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Chris. So when, when Mr. Mills was here previously, and he has arrived through traffic, so I appreciate his, his presence here, it was discussed about the, um, the potential changes to the interchanges, um, and I'm more concerned with the existing Scarborough connector right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, would any of these steps go beyond the, the, the main artery of the turnpike into those types of connectors, or are they going to be limited to just to the interchanges or, or the, the main turnpike itself? Right now, the alternatives that we, evaluate, that we are evaluating would look at addressing safety and mobility on the turnpike between 44 and 53. Um, the turnpike is engaged in looking at interchange improvements at this time, specifically at exit 45. Um, so that that is also ongoing in parallel for this effort. And any any thoughts around so 45 also ties into the Scarborough mm -hmm. connector. Would that come in our direction, or is there a kind of a limited scope of where you're looking at distance <coughs> from, the, from the interchange itself? You want me to answer that, Bruce? Or you want to answer that? And I I only ask because I know at this okay. point you at some point we need we have public input at yep. some point, and if it's gonna if it's gonna be uh, you know impacting us on that direction. That, that okay to talk. I always like. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I always find it's a good, you yeah. know, good thing to check. Uh, Forty-five yeah. is it mostly isn't going down the what so-called seven hundred one uh, very far at this time, but but as part of that, we're analyzing impacts. Okay. Um, so I mean, the turnpike doesn't own it. It's it's uh, DOTs. Okay. So at mm -hmm. this time, it doesn't include it. But um, as traffic engineering and traffic analysis happens. Uh, we'll be here to talk about it. And where, do you, could you explain where that line of demarcation is? Is it as the end of the exit, that, or is it? Uh, that I do know. So the line of demarcation. So the Scarborough connector, as everybody knows, if you get off at exit 45, it's it's the it's the straight road that goes all the way down to Route One. We lovingly refer to it as Route 703 because that's its real name. Mm -hmm. um, the line of demarcation is immediately west of the existing toll plaza. So. Um, Sorry, excuse me, immediately east of the existing toll plaza. So after you get off the turnpike and go just past the toll plaza, that's the point at which turnpike ownership ends, main mm -hmm. DOT ownership okay. begins. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. 
Other questions? <clears throat> Everyone satisfied? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank the presentation. Thank you very much. Order 18-31, 7 p.m. public hearing, second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the zoning ordinance of the Town of Scarborough, as presented. Uh, and I'd ask the planning director, Jay Chase, to uh, uh, commence this, and uh, after that we'll ask uh, the Crossroads team, Dan Bacon, to speak. Jay. Sure, I'll just do a, a quick overview of process, um, much like I did at, at first reading. Um, so as councilor members may recall, I think it was back in the winter where there was a workshop that you had with the, um, the Crossroads <coughs> development team that introduced a couple of concepts. Um, well, through the winter and early spring months, they worked with our long range planning committee um, to review and, uh, uh, and um, discuss a number of the different uh, ordinance amendments that were being proposed. Um, the Long Range Planning Committee act meeting act, uh, had actually two meetings with the team, one to do the initial review, provide some feedback, then from that the, the Crossroads team made some adjustments, brought those back to the Long Range Planning Committee, and at that time they were comfortable sort of blessing, if you will, the uh, moving <coughs> forward towards council. Um, Subsequent to your, uh, the council's first reading on this item, the, the item was before the planning board uh, just this past Monday evening. Planning board conducted their public hearing and I believe you should have those draft minutes um, from that meeting uh, with their comments. And with that, that's the process to date and I'm happy to answer other questions, but I believe <coughs> their team is prepared to go over the, uh, the amendments as proposed. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll uh, ask uh, Rocky Rosbera to uh, pick up on the introduction of this matter. Yes, good evening. Thank you, Rocky Rosbera, Crossroad Holdings. Uh, most of the development teams here with me tonight, as well as uh, Dan Bacon from Goral Palmer. Uh, we're pleased to be here for our public hearing and second reading for what we think is a very important piece of the uh, ultimate development of the down site. Uh, to keep it brief, Dan has a presentation probably around 10 minutes or so. We're, we're hoping to... Uh, Give you, give you some details, and, uh, uh, and we'll, we're happy to answer questions. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you very much. That's not a presentation about winter. I'm going to get the. Thank you again, Dan Bacon from Goral Palmer on behalf of uh, Crossroads Holdings, LLC. Um, we had a first reading with you, uh, I think about a month ago, in planning board um, public hearing, as Mr. Chase indicated just a few evenings ago. And we want to be brief. Hopefully, I can do my presentation as fast as Paul did earlier. Um, but really, these are, this is a package of zoning amendments, really, to build on uh, the Crossroads district that exists and to to deliver on the comprehensive plans goals for a, an exciting kind of mixed use project in the center of Scarborough. And these are amendments that we consider to be fairly modest to, to really bolster uh, the zoning district that exists. And to make sure it's very much a balanced project. Uh, and I say balanced in terms of the different uh, development and land use opportunities. Uh, right now, residential is allowed, commercial is allowed uh, as permitted uses. Um, but there are some commercial non-residential uses that aren't permitted that we think um, really could enhance the project and um, be catalyst uh, uh, development opportunities for the project and for the town. And those are really focused around kind of manufacturing, technology, uh, light industrial uses that, um, that are in high demand and um, that we think can be significant economic development opportunity for the for the community so we're before you this evening to, to talk a little bit about those uh, as well as some companion amendments and then also the zoning map change which is next on your agenda um, and 
kind of the timing is the timing is now. So we're we are seeking public hearing and hopefully a second reading and action on this because um, we have some users that are uh, very interested in this part of the project and um, the timeline is kind of critical to kind of move forward with getting those users um, in place and for the project. Um, so in terms of the, the proposed additional land uses, we're talking again about manufacturing, technology, some light industrial uses, um, and we're being, in working with the Long Range Planning Committee, very deliberate about how they can be allowed and where and under what controls. Um, so these are, these are proposed only in the northern part of the project, and when I say that, I mean the area towards Payne Road, um, which we think is most appropriate for that type of use. It's close to the Payne Road, it's close to the highway, it's close to similar um, land uses that are happening along Payne Road, and um, so it's very, has very good logistics and um, a very good location that can be buffered and isolated from from the rest of the project. So what's on the screen is, is only conceptual, but it shows the, that Payne Road area close to the Holmes Road intersection, and it shows a sense for the potential layout of uh, what we're considering to be um, kind of an innovation district, an area where that would attract those high-tech manufacturing light industrial uses that are right now Scarborough cannot accommodate. Um, just given there's a lack of inventory in the community. It's also a lack of inventory in the region. So uh, we see this as, as being uh, ripe for this part of the project. To, to get more specific around what the zoning is proposing, this map is actually proposed in the zoning language that would limit um, these specific uses to this area. And it's, again, the area of the property um, in close proximity to Payne Road. It's not near uh, residential neighbors. It's not near um, really any neighbors at all. Essentially, there's, there's limited development along uh, Payne Road in this area. There's also the, the Warren Woods Land Trust property, and then there's some, a variety of undeveloped properties um, to, the, to the east and to the west. When we presented this to the planning board um, the other night, they, I think, um, across the across the board, they are, seemed very much in favor of allowing these types of uses. I think where they had some questions that I want to talk about this evening was around um, design and around kind of um, buffering. And this illustration um, helps kind of give a sense how we think this zoning proposal can kind of overcome concerns about whether development in this area needs to meet the commercial design standards. Um, as I think the council, I'm sure, is aware, for commercial development uh, within the town, and that's not industrial development, for commercial development, uh, projects need to meet architectural standards, and that's in your design standards. Um, right now, in the town's industrial parks, industrial development doesn't need to meet design standards. So this, the uses that we're proposing here are, are really somewhere in between. I would say it's, they're kind of a hybrid where we're talking about manufacturing technology, kind of light industrial uses that um, many of these businesses want to have a nice aesthetic. You know, they want to have buildings that, that represent the town well, that represent their, their businesses well, that are kind of clean and modern but they don't fit neatly within the town's kind of commercial design standards that kind of get at more traditional development along, say, Route 1. You know, peaked roofs and uh, New England architecture. They're really kind of more modern type, uh, often flat roofs, um, maybe more metal involved in their construction, but they're still attractive. Um, so our proposal here is rather than complying with the commercial design standards, there's actually a mechanism in this zone that before you can start site plan review or review of a building, um, this part of the project would need to go through a master plan where the planning board sets the design requirements. So the planning board can work with the applicant on, all right, what is the right building design requirements to ensure they represent the town well um, and, and are compatible with what's happening around them? but maybe are, are set up differently than the town's commercial design standards. So we think there's a just as good a mechanism 
in the zoning um, to take that early step on, around design. Coupled with that, you know, this, this map illustrates, uh, again, the area that these uses would be allowed. And in the zoning, there's specific standards around setbacks from Payne Road, at least 250 feet from Payne Road, at least 250 feet from the Downs Road, and uh, over a, at least a 100 foot buffer to any adjacent residential zones. So this area really is going to be kind of tucked away. It's not going to be visible from Payne Road or the Downs Road or easily visible. Um, there's either going to be a buffer in between those or other development that meets the design standards or is commercial or residential. So I think this is an added measure to ensure that um, say different architecture that occurs here is, is separate from the surrounding streets as well as the surrounding development. So um, just wanted to highlight uh, what's in there that kind of can help address um, some of the planning board's questions around this commercial design standard waiver. This slide shows again a different perspective as to a potential layout of this innovation district or technology uh, district and some of the, the types of architecture that we're, we're thinking about. Um, so this isn't a rezoning to allow kind of warehousing and truck terminals and distribution that's kind of very utilitarian and very industrial. This is again somewhere in between kind of industrial uses and commercial uses um, and you know we'll have higher architectural standards and a more attractive presentation. This is a, just a quick slide that kind of shows, I think we've shown this a few times, but the footprint of the Downs in a few different contexts, um, Freeport is one, uh, community in Cape Cod that we're thinking about modeling after, and then the Portland Peninsula. And the relevance of this is really that this property is big enough to accommodate a variety of different development types, including this kind of manufacturing technology area, and then have a buffer to uh, that mixed use center that, that the project wants to fulfill and residential areas and everything in between. So uh, kind of gives you a sense of the scale of, of the potential project. Another component of the zoning amendment is um, a pretty specific and kind of tactical allowance for uh, gasoline fueling stations only at the Payne Road um, corner or end of the site. And uh, we see this as a kind of a key use in a very specific area um, on a corridor that allows for gas stations in other zones um, that can cater to um, the, the future traffic heading into the project. Um, and we anticipate destination development within the project that really necessitates a fueling station um, at this this end of the project and this entrance. It's also an important use for some catalyst um, users or end users in this project that, that essentially are expecting and demanding this type of service um, within the project. So it's on its own. It doesn't seem that exciting <laughs> or that uh, unique, but it, it is important to the overall development mix and attracting some, some catalyst users within the project that I think the that can help activate, activate this project. So in terms of specific regulations around it, um, like the town is regulates gas stations in other areas, there's a distance limitation where it only can happen within a thousand feet of the Holmes Road, Payne Road intersection within a project, which is that red circle, um, or two thirds of the circle up on, up on the map. I think the, the last two items that are part of this zoning amendment package uh, include really construction activities and, um, and earthwork on the site. It's an incredibly unique site um, in that there's going to be construction activity for, for a number of years um, and obviously phases of construction activity. And there's an opportunity here for there to be it to be somewhat sustainable in terms of uh, extracting you know, material that can be used in construction, um, storing material that can be used in construction, not having the truck traffic on um, the town streets. There's going to be some, but to minimize kind of impacts to the, to the surrounding road network and the community. And to enable that and to give clear guidance to us and also to the planning board on how that can work, we 
uh, included <coughs> some requirements for that, an operations plan, um, restoration plans, and really tools for the planning board to allow for and regulate how that happens so that uh, neighbors aren't affected by that kind of activity, so that um, where construction happens, it's closed out properly and, and um, dealt with properly from an environmental perspective. So um, that's been included in the language, and it's really only for development activity on the site. It's not to create you know, an operations yard for development offsite. It's really just to, to serve the project. Um, and, and that type of activity is allowed in other developments, just, just not on the scale. So we wanted to provide tools for the planning board to, to review that. Um, and I think the last item is really around syncing up kind of the landscaping and buffer requirements for this uh, district to, to <coughs> jive with the surrounding zones in terms of the buffer from, say, Route 1, Payne Road, and Highest Parkway to be consistent in terms of those requirements and also the, the buffers between commercial properties. Um, so. I don't think I met the 10 minute deadline, but I think that was close. <laughs> so um, I'm happy to answer questions if you have any. Um, and and, uh, I think as a part of the introduction, before we go to the public hearing aspect of this, uh, like to for the council members the opportunity to ask questions of either the planning director or Dan Bacon or his team. Uh, and also like to hear from the uh, two layers or representatives to the Long Range Planning Committee. We have both. Councilors Katarina and Kaizo, who uh, sit as ladies and representatives, to provide a fuller picture on what's transpired in bringing this forward to us today. So, questions for Dan or for Jay? Peter. Yeah, I think a question for Jay is in looking through the minutes from at least the, the, the planning board meeting Monday night, it seemed like couldn't quite tell if there really was a consensus that was drawn. Mm -hmm. I think there were some concerns about the gas station. There was some concerns about, you know, the, the design standards. I think a couple members were absent or not there. So it, was there a consensus Monday night on what the recommendation is, a majority consensus? Sure. So as you said, uh, we were missing a few members. We actually had only four of our typical three members there. Um, so I think as... Um, uh, chairman McGee, who was stepping in as chairman, tried to do at the sort of end of the minutes, tried to sort of go through, because there was some discrepancy or differences, yeah. um, so tried to go through uh, where the, the, the will of the board was. I believe, as I recall, the board was, and I, I can uh, open up my book here in a minute, um, but off the top, remember they were um, all generally or all in favor of the map amendments, but we'll talk about that as your next public hearing. Uh, in favor of the uh, amendments to the adjacent zones, the last item that Mr. Bacon just talked about. Mm -hmm. Excuse me while I refresh myself of all the other elements that are here. There were concerns by at least two of the members, I believe, with regards to um, the establishment of gas stations, as well as um, in terms of the... Um, uh, materials usage, the on-site materials usage and storage, as I um, would characterize it, board members were generally okay with the activity. I think there were at least two members who had some concerns with, with the standards or how that would be reviewed. Um, so I think they wanted to see a little more refinement of the language. Two others were satisfied with the language. I should say the same as with gas stations. Two who were there were, were satisfied. Um, and then the other element uh, in terms of design standards, I think there was some um, uh, hesitation to completely um, uh, eliminate the requirement for commercial design standards uh, in that, again, it was only in that industrial district that that would be, or inclusionary zone, I guess, is the, is the better term, um, where those would have been eliminated. Um, again, I hearing from the board, I think that generally they were okay with the concept, but it was the mechanism, the tool to get there that I think they felt um, might need a little additional tweaking. Um, and I, I think that was an item that I know the Long Range Planning Committee spent a bit, good bit of time talking about and potentially your, um, the two liaisons might be 
uh, in a position to speak about that, or I'm certainly happy to uh, about the Long Range Planning Committee talk about in that regard as well. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, um, I, I'd, I'd be happy to, to reiterate from Long Range Planning there, were, you know, we addressed those issues in, in, in pretty good detail. Um, we had a very robust discussion, and I think at, at the end we concluded that um, with some adjustments that were made on uh, the crossroads behalf uh, from the input that they got from Long Range Planning, that what came out was a, was a reasonable compromise and, and, and reasonably met the expectations that we had. I will ask um, Jay, if I could please, the clarifying question. Um, there's been a question about the design standards and, and, and basically allowing or removing those requirements. Uh, I, I think, I, I won't speak for the rest of the council, my, one of my biggest concerns is maintaining that check and balance system in the process. So there was some concern that by, by alleviating those design standards for this project that there wouldn't be a mechanism for the planning board or the council to be able to kind of check that process. Could you please explain in a little more detail what, what type of check and balance system is in place, uh, even if we waive these kind of design criteria to prevent basically crossroads from doing whatever they feel like in, in the zone? Sure. So if you were to move forward with the language as presented, which would eliminate the need for uh, commercial design standards just for those six uses that are listed um, in this area, as Mr. Bacon uh, described, there's a very um, deliberate and measured approach to any development review that happens in the crossroads. Really, there's a sort of a three-step process. Um, four, if we start all the way at the beginning when the planning board began look. Uh, began the process looking at all 500 acres, but as they zoom into each individual pod of 50 acres or more, um, the applicant needs to come forward through our plan development review process before they even get into a site plan or subdivision process. And that plan development review process is really sort of, uh, it goes through a, a site inventory analysis and then a master plan. And in that master plan process, there's a number of sort of overall elements that are considered in terms of street layout, building orientation, and one of them being general architectural standards. So what the board, if the if council were so inclined to move forward tonight, the board, planning board wouldn't necessarily turn to the commercial design standards, but they could have a conversation with the applicant about what are the sort of right measures to put in place for, again, it's these six sort of light industrial type activities that we're talking about, what would be the right sort of uh, parameters to move forward with? Um, you know, is it, you know, a, a stark metal building with overhead doors facing, facing the public road? Or is it something other than that? You know, a higher expect, maybe a little bit higher expectation in terms of orientation to the street or materials used on the building. Um, the, the board wouldn't have the tool of turning right to the commercial design standards, but certainly would have the opportunity to have that discussion because a master plan approval from the planning board is required before a submission for site plan can even occur. So there is a level of discussion that, that uh, would occur. Um, it's where, where that endpoint is, that would have to be worked out, of course. So would alleviating or removing these design standards inhibit the planning board in any way from maintaining their oversight on this project? As I said, it would be part of the, if there is a, a standard in the master plan of, a, approval process, and mm -hmm. it, I think it does need to be stated again that there is an approval for master plan. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a standard that talks about architectural um, standards. Now, um, again, they would be more negotiable, yep. um, but there would be a level of review there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Caterina, also on the long range Yeah, uh, as you know, I had a lot of questions and concerns as we went along. Uh, <laughs> like the Rockies kind of looking at me. <laughs> um, with, with some of these that uh, were cleared up, I, I frankly still have concerns about the design standards. And I know you talk about, so Jay, come on back up here. I'm going to ask you a question, please. Um, so you're, you're talking about. Um, you know, this master planning, and you didn't give Chris a yes or no answer. Maybe there isn't a yes or no answer, but you talk about architectural standards. Mm -hmm. Well, architectural standards mean different things in different right. utilization. Um, you know, architectural standards at Higgins Beach are totally different than architectural standards in the industrial park, where apparently we don't have any design standards. 
and frankly, uh, I, I'm that's one one of my sticking points uh, with this project as it is right now um, is you know so it's not I don't trust Rocky and the Michoos you know do a good job but what about ten years down the line what about ownership changes uh, those types of things so that's one of my questions and then the other question I'll ask you since you're up there is. How does this light industrial usage differ from the one that was approved, I think it was last year, on the Holmes Road or Two Rod Road? Or is a light industrial that was approved? Um, that was a few years ago. Oh, okay. Um, and so I would have to go back okay. and look. But are there differences? I and if so, what are they? Yep. Uh, okay, the, that's just, I'll, I'll try to answer okay. the first question. In terms yes. of, of my response to uh, <laughs> Councillor Chiazza, you're right. There is a, there is in, there would not be a sort of black and white, what are the design standards that would be applicable. That, that, that would, as I said, it would be a discussion between the applicant and the planning board. Um, because without the commercial design standards, then the planning board would have to Figure out what what is the right what what's the right procedure or elements uh, given the context of the development. Um, in terms of the differences between what they're proposing, I think um, are really there's six uses, and I guess I'll have to that are being proposed for this quadrant or portion of their property. would be the manufacturing and assembly, mm -hmm. food processing facilities, many, mini warehouse slash storage facilities, contractors offices, shops and storage yards, motor vehicle repair and service facilities, and sales, rental and or service of heavy equipment or specialized motor vehicles. Those are sort of the six activities that currently aren't permitted in the Crossroads District mm -hmm. Which, should this be approved, would now be permitted in the Crossroads District only in this area, and these are the only six uses in the entirety of this of the Crossroads District that wouldn't have the commercial design standards apply to them, as traditionally written. Right, but but uh, which brings me again to my next part of the question: that <coughs> these these six uh, usages that you have listed here for this, okay, it's not part of Crossroads plan of development, but I, how does it differ from what's allowed now in our other light industrial, because I've had, and the reason I asked these questions is I had a couple of phone calls from people who were still very confused about what is meant by light industrial. Uh, and so that, that, to me, that's a bit of a sticking point too. Well, let's see. So those six uses are all permitted in our industrial district. Okay. Um, I don't have my full zoning book. You mean industrial you. or light industrial? Industrial. We do have a light industrial right. district, and I haven't done the analysis as opposed to um, okay. which of these uses are also permitted in that zone. And there is, I guess, the other um, item I should reference in terms of sort of confusion around, uh, around light industrial is we have a, a defined term of light industrial uses. We also have a light industrial district. Um, so those are two different things. Um, but so I, that, That's probably that helps the with the confusion, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, um, Mr. Bacon? Dan, do you want to? Oh. I, I have one more question. I know. I, th I think Dan wants oh. to respond to oh, a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I wanted to, to speak a little bit more about architecture, where we're proposing to self-impose architectural criteria. I mean, this is not a attempt to make a fifth industrial park that is sort of vintage 1980s like Washington Avenue or, or Pleasant Hill Road. This, there are users that are interested in manufacturing technology, kind of re research, kind of light industrial users that care what their building looks like and are excited about this project being close to mixed use, being close to restaurant, being close to the, what we see as the future of 
kind of the core of the crossroads and, and what I think everybody's had in terms of a vision for this area. Um, and so manufacturing technology, those are the primary reasons that we're coming forward with amendments. And um, so we're planning on coming to the planning board with established design guidelines that fit those uses, that aren't kind of peaked roofs and kind of typical commercial development design guidelines, but are geared towards like what a lair looks like, say, down um, mm -hmm. on Southgate Road. There's sort of a higher end, high technology aesthetic, but they have materials that the town doesn't allow for in the design standards. Yes, there's some other uses that we think are kind of secondary that Jay listed off, like a contractor space. Like there's, there's a real big need for small contractor space in town. We see that as more like flex space where, mm -hmm. but the building can still be attractive um, because the higher end manufacturers are gonna care what their neighbors look like. So from a marketing standpoint, from a attraction standpoint, from a kind of value standpoint, and from an approval standpoint, we want it to be attractive and to have standards. We just think that commercial design standards are kind of square peg round hole. Um, so this is an attempt to kind of get out of good design. It's an attempt to kind of craft the right design requirements for these types of uses because they're, they're not really the right fit. Um, and I guess that goes back to my original concern, which was um, you used the term self-imposed. And yeah, I, I trust you guys will do it, but what if something happens? What if the economy tanks? What if ownership changes? But the master then plan what are governs. We? So okay. whatever is approved in the master plan applies to the land, not to Rocky or Peter or okay. me. It's, that's, essential, that's the governing approval. So regardless of the applicant, um, those rules have to be followed. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm Dan, uh, stay put. Question, further question? For Sorry, well, I'll be, I'll be <laughs> real quick. Do I know you have a question for Dan, or is it? Uh, I actually had a big question for, uh, um, sorry, come back, come back to it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You're fine. Um, so, Dan, could you or somebody else from the development team please explain the need for the urgency, sense of urgency now? I mean, mm. uh, you know, this was a project that we envisioned being very long term, and now suddenly it feels like it's we got to go, we got to go, we got to go. So, could you just address that as to why the sense of urgency now at, the, at, at this particular point? Without any marketing, um, our team's gotten a lot of inquiries <coughs> around manufacturing and technology uses, and there's a, there's at least two that are 60 to 80,000 square feet in terms of size each as a phase one, that could go to 100, that could go to 120 for phase two um, within three to five years that want to be here. Um, and I think there, there are uses that would generate significant tax revenue and employment and are what we're talking about, are kind of, aren't warehousing or truck terminals. They're technology, high, clean manufacturers. Um, so, uh, two weeks or three weeks matters to them from um, kind of being in the building standpoint. And I know it kind of sounds crazy, but they're, they're thinking about next June at this point in terms of um, needing to be in. And so if you do the math, um, it, every day kind of matters. So we wouldn't be <laughs> rushing the council if we're talking about mini warehousing or, or something sort of low value and low employment. Um, but these are sort of consequential businesses I think Scarborough would be proud of. And, and I don't mean to be flippant, but I mean, if they really want to be here and this is the place to be in the future, I, I don't see how two weeks could make or break that. But I'm not a developer, so I, you know, I, I'm sure, I'm sure there are, there's a different opinion that's coming to the microphone right now. <laughs> but, if I might address that. <laughs> uh, yeah, Go right ahead. Um, yeah. You know, what we're talking about are users that we definitely would want to have in the town of Scarborough. And they are going to be in a town mm -hmm. soon whether it's our town or another town. We're trying to uh, make some accommodations so that we can, we can have them in this town. Early on in this project, we recognized that this was uh, a use that was perfect for this area, uh, mm -hmm. and, and it was one of the only things that really wasn't allowed in the crossroads zone, and, and, and so we wanted to move forward as quickly as we could, and, and we are moving forward it, it, as quickly as we can, quite frankly. But the time frame 
Uh, the time frame is important to us because we have to uh, seek a master plan approval from the, from the planning board. Uh, we've got to come up with a, a site plan that'll work for the planning board. Uh, design standards have to be worked out. Uh, and then we eventually we've got to go to the DEP, get permits from them, come back and final approval, and actually build the buildings. Uh, and, and in the meantime, we can't even ask for it yet until it's allowed in the zone. So uh, we don't mean to have the council feel like we're rushing you. It's always been in our plan that, that this was, was something that felt like it was the right, the right spot and the right fit. And uh, we, frankly, we have to play the demand market. And uh, you know, when, when things are available, we, we have to be able to be nimble and, and, and meet that requirement, uh, meet, that, meet that request as quickly as possible. And uh, so that's, that's why it's important that, that we get this, uh, get this approved. Councilor Rowley. Thank you. Uh, so my question is really for um, Chris and Jean-Marie. Um, it's, it's kind of twofold. So, so Long Range Planning has met since Monday night since the planning board met? Mm -hmm. is that no, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, uh, to allude to that. We, we, we met when they initially brought the, the, the presentation to Long Range Planning. It was in a slightly different form than it is now. They, they, we, we did a little kind of feedback session. They made changes and adjustments, came back and did a second presentation that included those, those adjustments. Got it. So there hasn't been a change that you all have made since, Correct. The, since the first week. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Anything further? No. No. That was it. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I guess I'll just add that you know I, I haven't heard any any public feedback. Maybe that'll change tonight, um, but I, I haven't heard anything yet from any individuals. It sounds like Jimmy, you you have. Um, I personally have not, so I don't I don't I don't have any concerns at this point. That could change depending on who gets up to the microphone and presents something. But as it stands now, I, I don't see any. I, I mean, I understand. I'm a little uncomfortable with getting pushed. To, to speed this through, but I, I don't think really anything's changed in the in the in the structure of the of the agreement that would cause me to say, wait a minute, we haven't really got a final resolution yet, and and we're pushing this along. So I'm 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 comfortable moving it through uh, without any objections or, or any any noticeable issues from. from I, did, I did. I did. Uh, so uh, in the proposed amendment, um, there's a section that says the following uses are permitted only in planned developments, 37 and pet care utilities. Um, but I didn't hear that addressed at all. Can you just quickly just explain what that is? It doesn't sound like it's one of the things that would be in just that restricted area. Right. Yeah, there's a few things that wouldn't be in the restricted area. Uh, that's one of them. It's not a significant consequence. It was just a use that with a large development project, there might be um, demand for Having like doggy daycare or you know some, it's, really, it's just a service to to the community and, and to uh, employees that might work in this area or and residents that may live here. So that's something that um, you know it's customary in commercial zones, um, and that's why it's not under the other categories and so not limited to this area. Um, it's we don't have a pet care facility that's knocking on the door, so it's not a demand market kind of item is just something that we saw that many zones allow for. Gotcha. But it, when you say permitted only in planned developments, that's really anywhere in the zone as long as it's been planned and approved. Right. Yeah. So Got planned it. developments, everything that can that is a can happen in this in this zone needs to go through planned development. So it's not unique. It's not unique. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, before we go to the public hearing, I guess I would say uh, I, I would not want this process uh, speeded up. Uh, we did not want the Long Range Planning Committee to feel as if they were under undue pressure to uh, go forward, and they've been evaluating this for months. Uh, the Planning Board went through its normal process, so my sense is that we have followed regular order in getting to where we are tonight. And now, with the public hearing, we wanted to hear what the public's reaction was to any of this before we decided uh, whether to go to uh, second reading. So with that, uh, anyone wishing to address us uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the use changes to the Crossroads District, please approach the podium.
Don't feel shy. Someone has to go first. <laughs> close the public hearing. <laughs> Thank you. No, I think probably there's interest, but uh, 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 the uh, <coughs> we intend the introduction always to be informative so that people's questions get answered. Uh, that's really the, uh, a lot of it. Uh, we don't expect everyone in the room to jump up to the podium and, and <coughs> make remarks, uh, but you come because you have an interest in this, and we appreciate that. So. Uh, we have reached uh, the point where I'll accept a motion. Move so approved. moved. Second. Uh, uh, debate. Katie. Um, so I, I don't have any concerns, or uh, I've even gotten over my gas station concern. So <coughs> I'm past that. Um, but I do want to just reiterate again: uh, this project in total is, you know, a, a, a long-term project. And while I completely respect your need to, uh, you know, address that competitive edge in attracting the right people uh, for, to this spot, I want to be very mindful of going forward because while nobody spoke this evening at the podium, I guarantee we will hear uh, from folks that we changed, again, changed our agenda after it was already published, changed our process, and that <coughs> if we vote on it tonight and didn't follow the first reading public hearing second reading and I'm a stickler for that because some people you know who are, are working full-time and are very busy um, they didn't plan to come tonight because they thought well I can I can speak to it and take more time to research it at the next reading so I'm gonna support this e this evening but I want you guys to just be very mindful of going forward that this is our process and it's important from a public perception piece that we want the community to be behind every step of your uh, development and every step of the project and things like this whether real or perceived sometimes can throw up a barrier that's unnecessary so uh, I guess advice whatever take it or leave it um, but that's my piece but I will support it this evening thank you other comments from counselors Councilor Rowan yeah um, <clears throat> I think I'm, all, I'm in would like to uh, reiterate everything Katie said I, I agree with that um, but I the other I'm going to support it tonight. Um, I don't love the uh, the expansion of the use to the mini warehouse and storage facilities. I just don't don't see that as a highly valuable um, use. I get that that there are only so many places where you can do it. Um, so I think, we, but I'm not going to propose that we take it out at this point because um, I think it's been vetted, and I feel like I'm in an extreme minority uh, from the last time I spoke out against mini storage. Uh, <coughs> so. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll echo <coughs> my fellow counselors. The other thing that does make me just a little bit uneasy, and, and again, as a learning as a process going forward, it, it does make me uneasy that it, it felt like the planning board met. We had some members that were absent. They really didn't come to a clear consensus on some of these issues. I mean, it was basically half were for, half were against. That makes me really nervous. It makes me nervous because this is such a critical development for our community. I think I'll echo fellow cop. We should all be on board. If we're at a point where we half are uncomfortable, we really should make, take the time to get it right. That makes me a little nervous, I think. And then I'll kind of echo the comments around the design standards. Um, that, that does make me a little nervous. So I, I guess in the spirit of, of where I feel people are, I'll support it. But I really think going forward, I like this feels like a really kind of rushed process. I, I'd like more consensus from the planning board that aligns with long range planning and others. Uh, Jay, I wanted to ask uh, the question. Uh, you are undermanned with only four members of the planning board present. Uh, were, as I understand it, two of the members who were absent were long range planning committee members who had already weighed in? That is correct, yes. Okay. I, and, and so. I, I noticed, as, as Councillor Hayes did, this uh, idea that there wasn't as strong a consensus. Mm -hmm. But the two <coughs> planning board members who were absent had both already weighed in favorably as long-range planning committee members. Correct. It came out of the long-range planning committee. I believe, and I'm certain I'll be corrected, but uh, all the committee members were, it, it was a unanimous decision okay. to sort of send it along. Th that helps me to yeah. believe there was some greater strength in the commitment of the planning board. Councilor 
Kaiser. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I just, uh, you know, I, obviously I, I support the motion. I, I, like I said, I haven't heard anything from the public or anybody that, that tells me that we haven't vetted it properly, we dealt with it at long range. I'm not overly concerned with the, with the planning board. I mean, it had a quorum. There's a reason why we, we have those kind of rules and procedures in place. They can still perform their function. Um, I don't necessarily think that it was so controversial that the outcome may be different with the other planning board members there to, to, to the point where I would say, let's, let's kick it back to them and let them, the full planning board look at it. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I recognize the fact that they, there were four, but that's a quorum and they're still conducting business. So I, and, and again, the other two missing members I know had expressed their concerns and opinions at Long Range Planning. It was addressed and it was agreed moving forward. And I don't, I don't think anything changed, to your point, Council Rowan, between that Long Range Planning recommendation and, and what the planning board looked at. Councillor Katerina. Uh, you always get us confused. Yeah, I know. So so a couple of Italians. So Hey, knock it off. <laughs> um, I, I'll be honest. Um, when I got the word that they were going to amend this to have the uh, second reading tonight also, I hit the ceiling. I mean, I was like, what are you talking about? Why are we doing this? Why are we rushing this? Um, I also believe, you know, in the process uh, and that um, particularly in a project like this, I want it to be right. And I kind of feel like, you know, when I'm doing real estate business myself, you know, I represent a client. My client here is the town of Scarborough, the people of Scarborough, and I'm representing them. And, and then you guys, you know, are the buyer or, or seller or whatever on the other side of the transaction. Um, but that being said, um, you know, I feel that you answered, you know, my questions. But, I mean, I do have concerns about it being all in one night like this. But, um I will vote to support it, but don't let it happen again. No. <laughs> <You know? laughs> want to take some. We need to take some time, and I want this to be thoughtful. And I don't want anything backfiring on on any of this. So, Councilor Bayman, thank you. Um, I had uh, coming in um, had heard from others, and really they shared three concerns that have all been addressed. It was about the boundary. Um, I know that one of butter has reached out to the developer and has resolved uh, to their satisfaction a, a pathway to getting a solution. Um, the design standards and control, and I think I heard that the planning board and the planning department will continue to have control and oversight of that, so it definitely um, solves that problem. Um, the one piece is around the process, and I do appreciate Councillor Foley's uh, comments because it brings back memories of Piper Shores when that project was originally approved and the process that was undertaken. Very different circumstances in some ways, but very similar when you combine meetings, um, approval meetings. But um, I think circumstances require us to at least um, understand that. I do hope, though, at some point that um, that needs to be always remembered in whatever is coming forward. Um, you have a highly respected former town employee on the development staff that understands our process. Um, so I hope that that's taken into consideration for any future requests because at some point we do have to stick by what we have considered to be a proper process, for, particularly for zoning changes. Further comments? Are you ready to vote? All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Order 18-32. 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to the Town of Scarborough zoning map. And I again <coughs> would look to uh, Dan Bacon to introduce this matter for us. Uh, thank you. This is <coughs> obviously related to your, to your last action. Um, and on your screen is, uh, in orange, is the current boundary of the Crossroads District. And when it was adopted, it was intended to apply to intentionally applied to um, essentially all the property owned by the Downs um, with two exceptions. Um, at the time, the area that goes out to Higgis Parkway was, was left in the Higgis Parkway district, um, given its uh, relationship to Higgis Parkway. That's the area on the map to the, I guess to the bottom left there. Um, and there's kind of three connections. Um, from the property one to Sawyer Road and two to Route One that were left in the uh, the adjacent zones because of how narrow they are, and it, it made sense for them for the 
standards of those zones to leave them in the in the zones that are along those streets, along Sawyer Road and along Route One. Um, when uh, the Crossroads Holding acquired this property, it was it was discovered that um, the assessor's map didn't map the actual property boundaries, the actual ownership of the property. Um, so we're before you this evening. Um, with an amendment that would kind of correct that situation. Um, and the intent was, again, for the property to be zoned uh, consistently. So uh, this illustration shows kind of the adjustments to be made to, to have the property, uh, excuse me, have the zone follow the property boundaries, um, adding in some land and actually taking out some land um, based on <coughs> the locations there. And also to add in the area that is along Haggis Parkway um, the intention there is, you know, there's a master plan for this whole property that's required and interconnected roads and, and a kind of a good relationship uh, in terms of the development throughout the project. And we think it makes good sense to include um, the Haggis Parkway area. Um, there would we anticipate a main road coming in uh, from Haggis Parkway at, at some point to tie into the center of the project. And um, as we design, it, it really provides a lot of flexibility and a lot of good sense to have it zoned the same way um, for that for that process. Um, so that that's the uh, background with these um, map boundary adjustments. Um, we would leave those other three areas um, in their adjacent zones that I mentioned, the Sawyer Road and the two Route One areas, because of the reasons I stated earlier. Um, but update the boundaries otherwise. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the materials that were included in the agenda packet uh, by the planning director, uh, Jay Chase, uh, note that it is the intention of the Crossroads District to represent the Scarborough Downs property. Uh, there is always the risk, we have several realtors on here, of, of having dimensional issues that can arise, uh, but that is not intended to uh, uh, change the fact that whatever is determined to be the Scarborough Downs property is the Crossroads District. Uh, and uh, uh, we will always have the risk of title issues, but they will be resolved and the map will then reflect that, whatever the outcome is. Uh, like to have uh, anyone who would like to address this we will commence the public hearing on the zoning map amendments anyone wishing to address uh, this issue please approach the podium get, get the sense there's probably not going to be a large movement <laughs> <laughs> we'll close uh, and I'll uh, ask for a motion so moved second uh, discussion How's it rolling? Uh, can I just ask a question? Is there is there any dispute left with the with the boundary, or has that been 100 percent resolved? I can address that. Um, there's no dispute with us. <laughs> Jeez, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you look at the map uh, up on the top where it says A and B are four, there uh, the tax map shows three parcels of land. Um, the A parcel being one that didn't show that it belonged to us, but it actually did. And then there were two, two more parcels. The, there's there's a, an owner, a parcel away from us, that has a boundary issue with their abutter. That abutter is an abutter of us. So they have a dispute that could, down the road, cause a dispute with our direct abutter. I don't know if it'll ever happen. I think it's probably going to get worked out. Uh, but what we've what we've asked the council to consider is that if the boundary changes, we'll change the map. Thank you. Uh, uh, to that point, uh, Mark O'Leary did submit a uh, uh, an email uh, addressed to Councillor Babine. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, and uh, the town manager, uh, and indicating that he has met with Rocky and Bill Risbera, 
uh, worked out uh, a uh, working relationship and at this and I'm quoting at this time I would encourage the council to move the crossroads zoning map amendments along while preserving any future changes my opinion is that the town is fortunate to have two local families with the abilities and foresight to take on this project please support the changes needed to move the crossroads forward the opportunity never may never be created again thank you Mark O'Leary uh, so I think that says pretty much where we stand on that issue. Other comments from counselors? I have a question. Yes. Um, I'm just looking at our packet here again, and there's, is this an amendment? Oh. It, under C, zoning map one, and then two, it's in red. It says, under what, uh, the, unless otherwise indicated where district boundary apparently falls. Is this something that needs to be done tonight, or is that it certainly could be. I think it, I characterize this as maybe a belt and suspenders to the extent there's concern right. with, the, uh, with the action you're taking this evening, that it, it intends to follow the property boundary, whatever that is, now yeah. or in the future. This, would, this language would make it crystal clear uh, in that regard. Uh, and that's it, from it, our town attorney, right? This uh, I think Jay Chase could probably Jay. speak to it. Yep. Yeah. So if, if I may, um, so the memo that I provided really was intended to do two things. One was to lay out what the chairman did so eloquently that your action, should there be a dispute in the future, would still follow the property boundaries. What this issue brought to, the, to my attention was, in the last number of years, five, six, seven years, what have you, the town has, uh, through the long range planning process, updating our comprehensive plan and our zoning map, has really taken a uh, proactive step to try to have zoning changes over the last number of years follow property boundaries as best as we know them, i.e. our tax maps, rather than, as it used to be done, sort of a, a measurement off a road, say 500 feet of, you know, of depth off Route 1. And that, that caused complications for property owners, caused complications administratively on the town side to figure out what to do with these split lots, split zone lots. Mm -hmm. um, so for that reason, for a number of years, we've been following, as I said, the best available information tax maps. Um, and so when this issue came up, sort of said, well, you know, this is, yes, this is coming up here with the downs, but it could come up with any other um, property. So uh, having a discussion with our, our town attorney sort of said, is there a way that we could clarify moving forward that where the clear intention of the council's action in a rezoning for the map, I should say, of the map, is to follow a property boundary to the best uh, information we have available, that that is the intent. And so if a, 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 t a future survey shows that a property boundary is 50 feet or 100 feet from where we thought it was, the map would simply follow, the zoning would simply follow that property boundary. So that language is not intended to um, confuse the downs process uh, that you're considering tonight. Um, my feeling is it's really an administrative uh, type function, clarifying language in the ordinance. Um, and um, it, it would be uh, my assertion that if the council were so inclined to adopt that as an amendment to this process, it would help clarify any future potential conflicts like this. Um, but staff would be happy to sort of initiate a, a fuller process if mm -hmm. you felt that was necessary. It, it is uh, associated, very obviously, directly associated with the zoning map. We have a zoning map uh, uh, amendment here before us. The relationship is close enough that I, I would entertain it as a motion to amend. Uh, it, this was not part of first reading, uh, which is what's before us presently. So it would have to be put forward as a motion to amend the language which Mr. Chase has provided us in the uh, agenda packet. What's your pleasure? <laughs> uh, okay, I'll I'll move to amend the uh, uh, the um, zoning map to with the description to match the. Recommendation from the planning director to include section two as written. Second. Discussion on the amendment. Councilor Kettering. I think it makes perfect sense. When I read it, um, I, I do think it helps clear up any issues 
because I see it all the time, so yes. I would like to have something like this. It formalizes the, uh, yes. the legislative history yes. of always using the actual boundaries. Yep. So I agree with you. Other comments? Ready to vote on the motion of amend. All in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Uh, motion as amended. Uh, uh, discussion? Councilor Carrizo. Yeah, I, I mean, very similar to the previous matter that was before us. This was discussed in detail along with mm -hmm. range planning, um, uh, along with the usages. Um, there, there was concern, um, I shouldn't say concern, the, the discussion centered around parcel A and parcel B um, in terms of the abutters and, and how they would interact. There's a, there's a um, neighborhood, if I understand, in the area of A. Um, so that was addressed and concerned. Um, I had some concerns on Section B because uh, I, I, I didn't want to necessarily change the feel of the Haigus Parkway. I thought we worked hard to kind of keep that continuity. Uh, but I think that issue was addressed in terms of the amount of area that's actually developable in Section B is very, very limited. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily that whole stretch along Haigus Parkway. So uh, that certainly from my perspective alleviated the concern that we're going to have a zone within a zone and now Haigus, the Haigus people are going to want to change and have everything uh, adjusted to accommodate their needs as well. So, um, and, and that was also discussed very detailed and in depth at Long Ridge Planning and resolved, if you will. So. And thank you. Other comments? Roth. Yeah, I guess my, my concern is now that we've amended it, we've taken like what, what appears to me to be a no-brainer uh, decision and now very quickly made it to something that's much larger and we now change our zoning ordinance. Which doesn't say we can't change it back if we, if we determine there's a problem with it, but I just, I'm concerned with what we just did. Um, I'm still going to support it, but I just have reservations about the, uh, the change to the overall zoning ordinance. Uh, the the, the, I, the amendment I, that, we just, that we just passed. And I, and I think the thing that influenced me was that uh, the planning director uh, uh, in discussions advised that this has been the historical practice. And so what we would be doing is codifying what has been the historical practice. And it arose in this context. And so this was an opportunity to put it into the, uh, the ordinance. And I thought that was uh, appropriate. Other comments? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, order 1836, 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the renewal request for a special amusement permit from the following businesses. Black Point Inn, located at 510 Black Point Road. Bailey's Campground, located at 274 Pine Point Road. Migas Hotel Group, Higgins Beach LLC, DBA Higgins Beach Inn at 34 Ocean Avenue. Libby Mitchell, Post 76 at 40 Manson Libby Road, Loyal Order of Moose, <coughs> located at 19 Spring Street, The Landing at Pine Point, at 353 Pine Point Road, Clam Bake, located at 352 Pine Point Road, Bailey's Lobster Pound, located at 78 King Street, Tagello LLC, DBA, The Garage, Barbecue, located at 3 East Grand Avenue, and O'Reilly's Cure, located at 264 U.S. Route 1, and I'll ask the town clerk to introduce this. Thank you. Um, back in October of 2017, I believe the, uh, the council amended the uh, special amusement application. So the process <coughs> this year was a little different in that the uh, butters within 200 feet of the establishment received letters indicating that there was going to be a public hearing on these establishments. And if they had any concerns, to please let us know. Also, um, the application was for... Um, it was part of, we implemented part of the Good, good Neighbors Noise Ordinance. And on the application itself, the um, applicant, if they felt that they needed to be exempt from the, the noise listed on, in the Good Neighbors Ordinance, would, re, in writing, make a request. At this time, no applications have asked for any uh, request for exemption. We did receive a number of phone calls uh, asking what the special amusement permit was. We explained what it was. People understood. We did receive some emails um, in support and some um, voicing concerns. And I have those on your bias this evening. Great. Uh, and I 
think we had, uh, let's see if I can summarize, uh, uh, concerns about, uh, uh, and it's noise, out, outside noise uh, by neighbors, uh, Bailey's Lobster Pound uh, and uh, the Garage Barbecue uh, and Landing and Barbecue all had uh, a, a Butters Express concern. The, key aspect of this is that not, our application now makes clear you have to ask for a waiver of the noise ordinance in our good neighbor uh, ordinance and none of these applicants did and therefore all of them are subject to the noise restrictions uh, uh, and I would direct you to the good neighbor ordinance for those provisions. Uh, Public hearing. Uh, anyone wishing to address this, please approach the podium. My name is Cliff Moulton. I live on the Ross Road uh, across the street from Bailey's Campground. I live in an R2 zone. Uh, I, I would like to get the Good Neighbors Ordinance enforced. I have tried it for years against noise from the campground. Uh, it has turned into an amusement park. They are entertaining two or three nights a week. Uh, I live approximately 400 feet away across the public way in an R2 zone. There are times when my doors and windows rattle because of the volume. I cannot conduct a conversation in my property in the yard without going inside and closing the doors and windows. I cannot entertain. I cannot enjoy a night on the porch on a good summer night, which are very few in the summer. And I cannot put the grandkids to sleep let's say at 7 to 10, without closing the windows so that they can have quiet. Now, I've called the police a number of times in the last few years, asked them to come down to witness the noise, to write it up and at least put it on record from me. So they have done that. I haven't abused the issue. I have talked to the uh, ordinance enforcer. He said he would look into it. Uh, he would talk to Bailey. Uh, evidently, Bailey didn't want to change anything. As I understand it, the speakers are pointed directly at my house and my neighbors. Um, generally, I have written to each one of you last year requ we're requesting help to quiet down the campground. Uh, you have put one of your people in charge. We have talked to them. I invited them down during a performance. We have sat in my room, in my living room, with doors closed so that we could talk. And her comment was, I can still hear them. Uh, I asked that if you issue it, it would be conditional. I mean, they seem to have used the good neighbor's ordinance in every aspect. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was one night a week. They have increased it to two or three nights a week. Uh, the volume has gone up since then, and they have violated curfew a number of times. Uh, last year, it was until 10.30 on a Sunday night that it didn't get over, which is an hour and a half after the record, nobody seems to want to enforce the good neighbor ordinance. The police won't, the code enforcer won't, I can't seem to get you people. It was brought to uh, your attention, I guess, last year, and I guess you did nothing about it. So it seems that the people, my, my neighbors, the good neighbors, are being persecuted 
and when you offer this, this special permit, you seem to be rewarding bad behavior from some of the businesses. And I would like to, you know, have you make it conditional that they must uh, obey the good neighbor ordinance because most of us are good neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Others wishing to address this issue? My name is Laura Lee Downs. I live at uh, 79 Jones Creek Drive. I'm about three houses up from Bailey's Lobster Pound. Um, points changed a lot, um, as you can well imagine, and you know, things progress. And so with the uh, onset of uh, the bait shed and all that sort of thing, we, we seem to have a lot more people down there. But I think, you know, Sue and Vinnie work really hard to uh, try and keep all that under control. The concern I have um, is that if, and I under, is, can I, he's okay if I ask Sue, she's sitting right here. Live music, is that what we're, is that what we're, yeah, okay. 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 Um, that was just one of my concerns, you know, how late is it going to go? How often is it going to be? Um, <coughs> and it, there's already, uh, between Memorial Day and Labor Day, the, the amount of traffic and everything increases. Oh, exponentially down there. It's just awful. There are times I come home from work and I think, how would an emergency vehicle ever get through here? I mean, it's, you know, it gets just really crowded and cramped. And so I'm thinking, geez, live music now, more people, those kinds of things. So these are, <clears throat> I'm not somebody who's, I've always supported local business. Um, I, I want, I don't want to be that neighbor. You know, I want to be a good neighbor. Um, and, and I think I think we always have been. I think we've always managed to you know work things out. Um, I have one of those neighbors, and it's not that much fun. Um, but I, I just I just have those concerns. Just um, uh, but if I think if things are if it's you know reasonable hours and that sort of thing, <clears throat> I think it's sometimes um, easy to forget. Some of us, you know, between Memorial Day, Labor Day, there's a lot of vacationers, people on vacation, and everybody should be able to enjoy. I I, I get that. Um, I'm not on their vacation, and <laughs> you know I, I work for a living 40 hours a week. Lots of times, a lot more than that. So good night sleep is important. Um, and getting woken up in the middle of the night by you know stumbling drunks yelling and having a grand old time. I don't want to rain on anybody's parade. I want everybody to have a good time. Uh, but I just think we just need to be conscious of those kinds of things. Uh, the, you know, any extra people that might come in and or uh, and all the problems that that might bring with it. Uh, but again want to be a good neighbor, but just wanted to express that. So I thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Others wishing to speak? So Susan Bailey Plow, not of Bailey's Campground, but of Bailey's Lobster Pound and the Garage Barbecue. I would like to speak to Laura Lee's concern. Um, they're very good neighbors. Um, my family's been on that property for, well, we're now five generations deep. Um, and Laura Lee's family's been there for many generations as well. We do consider ourselves good neighbors, um, much like the conversation with Laura Lee. When my neighbors have a problem with anything that's going on with me, generally they come to me. I'm very accessible. I'm always in the building. Um, it, and it, I can solve a lot of problems when people come to me. And we are a small village, and we have to behave that way because we are in buildings that are side by each as they were 100 years ago, not as they were developed with a quarter of an acre in other parts of Scarborough. So. We have to have these conversations. Uh, my entertainment is only in afternoons. I wouldn't be a very good business person if I added entertainment to a night when I was already full. Um, so I'm thinking, yeah, I have people booked for Wednesdays at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and I would never, I, I read the Good Neighbor Ordinance before checking the boxes, and none of it seemed to apply to me because I'm facing out toward the water when this person is playing. Um, and the two abutting properties, the two residential abutting properties to my building belong to me. So it, it's very unlikely that anyone would ever hear it from the other side of the street, but if they were to come to me and say it was causing them a problem, I would turn it down. It's, it's what I do. Um, Laura Lee's family, for example, we, we combine with them to use our property for them to do fireworks on um, New Year's Eve. You know, we, uh, we almost exclusively this time of year, our customers are our neighbors. Um, you know, I, in the letter that I wrote that was sent to the town council, I would, which I wouldn't address every item, but 
you know, we've ex my husband and I live next door. My father lives upstairs. We have a five-year-old. We are very invested in the community. Uh, we, we are not out of towners there with a business. You know, we live right there all the time. Um, so we have a very vested interest in making this a residential, happy community where, where people are not disturbed at night and all of these things occur. If there's ever a problem down there, we're the first people to call the police because I don't want it going on. If something's wrong, I take a hand in straightening it out. So um, as to one of the comments in here about property values, I find it interesting that you know most of the real estate ads for places in Pine Point are now advertising with pictures of my business in their, in their real estate ads. Um, so I'm not sure that complaining about property values is particularly relevant, but um, I, I would just like to say that I, I fully intend to be a good neighbor, and if I were ever bothering anybody like Laura Lee or the families that come and talk to me routinely about any issue they might have, I, I always respond to those. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to speak? Close the public hearing. Accept the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Comes through. Um, so Go I was invited down to Mr. Moulton's house last summer uh, and uh, was the person sitting in his house uh, as the music was playing at Bailey's. And we did have all the windows and doors closed. And it was indeed. Um, louder than I, I ever would have imagined. I did send that forward to ordinance, and ordinance did have some discussion around it, which is part of why the uh, application was amended. Um, you know, I do have growing concerns that, um, you know, that that community is changing, and, and how we pay attention to how that ch is changing is important. Um, that said, we have to treat these businesses equally and fairly uh, in doing so, so I, I would be uh, pleased to see if ordinance would take another look at it and perhaps develop some kind of mechanism by which if there were three violations in a season that for that season they they might lose that that right to have the amusement because I think that is a privilege and an extra piece not necessarily a part of their original business plan so it, it just it's just an idea that popped to my head and something I think that is wor worthy of further discussion um, but again, I, I do think we have to be mindful of we can't pick one business over the other. We have to kind of do something that would work for all of them, um, and enforcement is going to be key. Other comments? Councilor Rowan. Yeah, my, my, <clears throat> we did have extensive discussions around uh, the Bailey's campground specifically uh, as a result of email as well as some of the complaints from Mr. Moulton and from some of his neighbors. Uh, and uh, uh, that was the the intent of adding it to the to the permit as well. And at that point, we talked about that they're always conditional. We can revoke them, um, is my understanding. Um, but I, I would have no problems adding additional language to this approval in particular, because um, I think I I do think that from the complaints that I've heard and um, that there seems to be a a willful negligence. Uh, potentially here around the, the noise issue. Uh, and uh, But where they didn't check, the, the noise ordinance is very specific. It's now on the application. They have not asked for a waiver. Um, so the expectation is they're going to adhere to it. And I, I do hope that we will be enforcing it uh, vigorously. Or I'm certain that we'll be enforcing it vigorously. Councilor Keza. Yeah, so I, I, it, it strikes me, as with any ordinance, it's possibly an enforcement issue. So I, I guess mm -hmm. I would ask staff, um, you know, do we, do we, how do we get that feedback? I mean, typically we ask that in the, in the application process if there are any concerns or any issues. Um, it sounds like there have been several police calls. Um, how would we get that feedback? Would it have to be a violation that was issued, or would we have to seek that information out s separately? Certainly we could inquire and, and they could report their experiences under the new ordinance. I'm not sure if we've got enough runtime to have uh, a good good experience, but um, okay. and we'd have to really understand the particulars of their visit uh, on these occasions, uh, whether it was just recording something was going on or whether it was actual measurements taken, those sorts of things. But uh, at your request, we could certainly provide a report as to our experience so far. I, I would like to see that. Uh -huh. I mean, specifically, I, I, decibel levels and stuff is difficult to quantify, but certainly if you're violating a curfew, that's pretty straightforward. Sure. 
Um, I would think that's that's a go no go type of enforcement. I, I would personally like to see something like that, and I would support any kind of uh, additional language so that we get that feedback. Because I, I remember, if I recall, with the garage and with the bait shed last year, yes. it was conditional as well. If we were going to hear, if we heard anything back in the negative, then we would certainly be addressing that in this cycle. And I, I don't believe we've heard anything. Um, but again, if we've got egregious behavior and it's not being enforced, I think we have to have some kind of check back mechanism or some way to, to, to get recourse for that. The change from last year to this year is we now have the ordinance in place where it is declared that the good neighbor noise ordinance applies, mm -hmm. and yeah. you need a waiver mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to get it. Mm -hmm. So uh, at this point, you as a amusement permit holder are on notice, uh, and you could ask for a, an exemption, You and if it was successfully argued before us, you could get it, but none of these have. And therefore, we ought to have a, a different sense of enforcement this time around. Councilor Caterina. Um, I'm looking right here at the Good Neighbors Ordinance, and I know under specific prohibitions, sub four under noise abatement. I mean, it specifically states, and this is where, you know, we do need to start enforcing. If we're going to have these ordinances, we need to enforce them before we go trying to change them. And it specifically talks about mm -hmm. um, machine or devices producing, reproducing music, sound audible outside of a structure, blah, blah, blah. And then it talks about a minimum of 200 feet from source of noise. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are the types of things we need to be enforcing. And, and from what, remember, I wasn't on council last year, but it sounds like this would be the first summer where this, so we mm -hmm. really need to be enforcing what we've got. And I think the residential neighbors in Pine Point, where this seems to be uh, most of the problem, they, they deserve to yeah. be protected. Other comments? Katie? Uh, a just a clarifying question, though, and, and I know that we did discuss the fact that we could revoke, um, but it's not necessarily, uh, I guess, is it First offense? Do they just pay a fine? Is it is it delineated that clearly that when and how they would lose that? I guess that's why I get what I where I think we could potentially tighten that up um, because it doesn't really say whether it's I'm just going to pay a fine and then I continue to hold my permit. How many times do I pay the fine before I lose it? Tom, on, the, on the permit itself, the license is issued. Yeah. It can be revoked any time by the council. Right, but then so, we're stuck in that subjective piece again, I feel like, sometimes, which is harder to enforce. I, just just my thoughts, but, I mean, I, we don't have to chew on it all night today. There are but penalty I think, provisions, and there's also the right, right. of revocation. Right. Uh, uh, and this is an issue. It, 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 it deserves attention, and, and we, we commit to those residents of Pine Point, we will not let this summer pass without being very conscious of it. Other comments? Yeah. Uh, so I, I think it's important to note that in previous years, I think that the fact that those uh, permits were granted uh, may have given the impression that, that uh, they were not subject to the noise ordinance. And we made very clear with yeah. the application this year that they are, in fact, yeah. subject to it. Um, so I think that, that it, both for you know town staff as well as the permit holders and all of their neighbors, they, everyone is now should be aware. Absolutely, and that was the result of conferring with council to make sure that that was an appropriate interpretation of our ordinance. Councilor Bailey. I'm sorry, just a clarifying question on that. So if, I, I think it's a great idea to send this on um, the ordinance issue to ordinance and if there is some re, uh, revisions, absolutely. If there are changes, aren't even though the permits were granted before the revision, they're still subject to the revisions, are they not? Yes, they are. Good question. Right? <clears throat> Yeah, normally you're saying when, yes, and he's um, looking at the um, um, <laughs> normal manager. I shouldn't say he. The manager's looking when at me. It, when an ordinance is updated, right? You uh, unless you are specifically grandfathered right. by provisions of the ordinance, okay. then you're subject to it. Okay, that that gives the legislative body here, the town council, the right to make that decision. Okay. And for staff and for the applicants, we've made it absolutely clear that this is not an exemption. There's still held to the same standard unless they've asked for some exemption, and they've not. And this will be the first year yeah. that we've had such clarity in that matter. Yeah. Okay. 
Further comment? Seeing none, ready to vote. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Thank you for your input on that. Uh, order 1837, 7 p.m. Public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's license from Angela Wallace Hool, DBA Sweet Frog Frozen Treats, Main LLC, located at 300 Gallery Boulevard. And I'll ask the town clerk to introduce this one. And uh, transfer of ownership, which requires a new food handler's license. Uh, the application's on file. Everything is in compliance. And they're just waiting on their occupancy permit. Once that's issued, we'll issue the um, food handler's license. Uh, anyone wishing to address the council on this matter, please approach the podium. Close the public hearing. Uh, accept the motion. Move approval. Second. Second. Discussion. Just a clarifying Move question. It, it, clarifying question. Is this just an ownership change? Is that? Yes, but it still requires a Got it. license change. Other comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Uh, all business, uh, <clears throat> order 1828, second reading on the proposed municipal school budgets for fiscal year 2019, and I'll ask the town manager to begin the introduction of this. Yes, uh, council has obviously passed the, the budget in, in first reading uh, based on your published adoption schedule. In the intervening weeks, uh, the town's finance committee has met a total of five times to my knowledge, and I think... Uh, on a couple of those occasions, they met jointly with their colleagues on the school side as well. So the budget has gone through the normal review process with the uh, Finance Committee. It's worth noting the Town's Finance Committee this year is the same three members that we've had for, this will be the third year running. So there was a high degree of kind of understanding of the budget, its process, and some of the inner workings of that. So uh, from my perspective, uh, the discussion commentary was kind of very uh, specific and targeted and I think quite productive. Um, the result of that effort uh, was a series of recommended adjustments and I think it's only appropriate for the finance chair to offer those up and as is customary, typically the first amendment that's considered would be the host of uh, amendments from the finance committee uh, as a starting point. Very good. And I'll recognize the uh, finance chair after I give people the opportunity in the audience to comment on the budget. Uh, anyone wishing to address the budget, uh, please uh, present yourself at the podium. I'm Susan Hamill, uh, 3 Bay Street in Pine Point. Last fall, the town council committed to a tax increase for its 2019 budget of no more than 3%. And that was before the effects of the town-wide commercial revaluation. Our commercial sector has been seriously undervalued and has underpaid their fair share of property taxes for several years, forcing the residential sector to carry more than their fair share of the load. Residential taxpayers are way overdue for some relief from these endless tax increases. But instead of doing the right thing and fulfilling your commitments on some tax relief from the long-awaited revaluation, the town instead is using the increased valuation to fund spending increases. The budget would have meant a tax, in this budget would have meant a tax increase of 4.4% without the revaluation. No real effort was made to make cuts from the originally proposed budget introduced back in April. In fact, an additional $350,000 in expenses was added back into this budget. Using the commercial revaluation then brings the expected tax increase down to what would seem like a reasonable 1.4% increase. But we should have no increase at all in taxes this year. It was easily achievable if the council had met its own goal of 3%. I sat at a table outside the polling area at the recent recall election, and I was amazed at the diversity of voters, and in particular, the large number of people voting who did not have kids in our schools. 
over and over, I heard from voters that th this election was about so much more than the school board. It was about sending a message to the board, to the town council, and to the town manager. It was a vote against arrogance and attitude of some of our public officials. And this means the town council, this council. It was a vote saying, listen to us. Let us participate in the discussion. Don't underestimate us. The gamesmanship going on with this, with this budget is seen and it's understood. The taxpayers of Scar Road deserved an honest budget which would have met the 3% goal without the reevaluation. That budget would have passed on the first vote in June. Too bad. Too bad for the town. This was a real opportunity to start the healing process, but not happening. Good evening, Benjamin Howard for Oakdale Drive. Two weeks ago, I was fortunate enough to sit down with the superintendent and the chair of the school uh, finance committee. They did a fantastic job at answering most of my questions, but like any good student, it led me to ask more questions. It was my takeaway from that meeting that the 70% of the school budget is made up of contractual agreements uh, in regards to salaries and benefits between the town. And the only way to really affect those numbers currently would be to reduce the number of employees. So I decided to take a look into those contractual agreements to understand exactly how they affect our budget. Um, as I had never looked at contractual agreements before, I also graphed out three other towns' data, including Cape Elizabeth, Gorham, and Biddeford. My findings were fairly interesting. Scarborough, um, each of these contractual agreements, for a little bit of background, is for three years of the teacher contract. And what I graphed out was the percent increase from your year one salary to your year two salary, and your year two salary to your year three salary as you moved up the experience levels. In Scarborough, it was very interesting. As a teacher moving up from experience level uh, two to three, um, in the first year of the budget, they would receive a 6.3% increase in their salary. Interestingly enough, when you look from the years two to three percent increase, that's a different teacher moving from that same experience level would receive an 8.3% increase in salary. Some would say Scarborough's being smart and accounting for a percent um, increase in living. But if you look at the same time period for a teacher with a BA plus 15 credits in the first year of that time contract, they received a 9% increase, and in the second year, they received an 8.4% increase. You do not see this in Cape Elizabeth, Gorham, or Biddeford. No matter what year a teacher moves up a rung, they always receive the same percent increase. The other notable thing from the uh, collective bargaining agreement uh, with the Education Association and the school board is Scarborough is the only town that goes above a 7.37% uh, increase in salary. That is at Cape Elizabeth. Scarborough goes as high as 9.73% increase in salary. I believe as this is 70% of the budget, this is where we really need to look and individuals from the community need to elect members of the board that can sit and make sure these contracts are beneficial for both the teachers and for those in the community. So as the budget is presented here tonight, I will accept it, but in the future, if we continue to have these inefficiencies in our budget, I cannot stand behind a budget like this. Thank you. Paula O'Brien, Pondview Drive. For the last couple of years, you, the town council, have been touting the slogan, one town, one budget. You also have, been, have said there would be less than 3% increase in the overall mill rate. Now, I don't pretend to know everything there is about our town budget, but I am learning. And I have learned that with a less than 3% increase in the tax rate, as promised, and a commercial revaluation this year, that this could be the year to finally give all taxpayers in Scarborough a needed break 
but sadly it seems that the expenses will not be reduced and the taxpayers in Scarborough will not get the break they deserve. You've used the Wentworth windfall, the fund balance, and now using this commercial revaluation for the rate reduction rather than looking for savings in the budget. I feel the residential taxpayer should receive the full benefit of the revaluation, especially after overpaying for years. So many want to see a majority town council that could be looking for more ways to save money and find revenue other than the taxpayers. Yes, I'm sure you do work hard on the budget, just as sure as I am the audience listening works hard at what they do too. And I bet none of them have ever gotten a 24% increase in their pay after one year, no matter how hard they worked. That's just one item in this budget many see as excessive. As you all know, this town has been fractured over accusations for lack of transparency, lack of communication, questioning ethics and procedures, and most of all, not being listened to at all levels of this town government. You have the power to help bring this town together by asking for further reductions in spending by both the municipal and school sides of the budget before it goes to vote on just the school portion to the public. One town, one budget, remember? There are plenty of places in both budgets to bring the tax rate to the less than 3% as was promised by you, the town council, before the commercial revaluation and without the usual scare tactics. This is the perfect time for the town council to gain some trust in this town or lose it. Don't pit the people of this town against each other in another budget battle and do the right thing before sending it to the voters. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to address the council on the budget? <clears throat> Close the public hearing. I will comment that the commercial revaluation, the partial revaluation, was known in December, uh, months before the budget was ever put out. So that, just so that the record is clear. <clears throat> uh, I'll uh, accept a motion. So okay. move. Second. Uh, Discussion on the motion. Recognize the Finance Committee Chair. Yeah. yeah. Good evening, everybody. Um, you heard a little bit at the top. The Finance Committee has been working and actually met and sat, met with each department of, of the municipal departments and kind of went through their budgets in detail in front of, in front of you and included in the budget materials was our recommendation of adjustments that we're recommending tonight to reduce the municipal budget by $205,000, which is reflected in the documents that are included in the agenda packet tonight. Um, we also included, which was referenced in the prior comments, an additional item of $350,000, which really rec reflects what we believe is a liability that may be out there. We wanted to be conservative and, and reflect it on the books. So that's sort of where we are. In the, uh, I guess I'll turn this over to the the will of the council about whether you want me to go down through each individual item that's on the agenda in front of you or whether you'll accept them or just ask questions about the items that are on here. Well, would you like to make the motion to amend uh, and uh, 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 identify yep. the outcome as done by the Finance Committee? Yes. Yep. So this is the motion would be to accept the Finance Committee's recommendation to reduce the proposed 2019 budget by the amount of 2004-522 and to recommend to the assessor an increase of $350,000 in the overlay for the new budget of 65-891-542. Thank you. And I'll ask for a second. Second. Uh, we have a, a motion to amend and a second uh, discussion. Yeah, I, I guess there are a couple of deferrals here that I that I have reservations about until I can hear kind of the um, logic and um, impact of uh, what we're doing. I'm concerned just with um, with making. Well, I guess what I, I guess I'll, I'll take them one at a time. I, I wonder if you could talk about the deferral of the um, office renovations and what the impact would be. I'm pleased to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this matter is actually deferred last year as well, or in the current year, I should say. 
this has long been a plan to make uh, the area much more customer friendly. Uh, if you've ever been in the planning office, it's a fairly small reception area, limited counter space for uh, residents to come in and, and do their work. It also provides for some uh, small improvements for uh, circulation and productivity as well. Um, it's cert certainly something that we'll continue to come back for, but in light of uh, kind of the circumstances, uh, we do believe it's one thing we could defer. Uh, but that doesn't mean it goes away. It's deferring it for a future year. I see it, uh, and you'll expect to see it on future capital uh, budget requests. Okay. And my understanding is we have um, uh, nine people now in, in a space that was intended to accommodate seven. Is that, or excuse me, intended to accommodate four? Is that? Well, there's yeah. a, in the private offices, I think we've been as, uh, as strategic as we can in terms of uh, accommodating. Keep in mind, a number of the code officers are out in the field most of the day, but they obviously do have uh, work they need to do back at the office. Um, so again, this is something I, I, I'll continue to come back with, but I think we can certainly live without for another year. Okay. Uh, next was the uh, UPS generator and uh, battery standby, for so when the power is out to continue to power the lights at some of the major intersections and stuff? Yeah, this will enable uh, three intersections, um, Hannaf Nor Hannaford Drive and North, if you will, on Route 1, uh, to be uh, enabled with some kind of uh, switch gear, if you will, for quick connect in the event of power outage. Uh, those lights are fairly low draw for power, so they're powered by a fairly small uh, handheld portable generator. Uh, we still have the capability um, but this will allow us to have a kind of a quick connect and be able to do that much more efficiently. Uh, this is another one that we'll likely come back to you on. Um, this happens uh, fairly consistently throughout the course of the year and some of the worst weather conditions. So the quicker we can make those sorts of connections, the better. We did look at using uh, possibly using traffic impact fees, uh, but the area that we're uh, we're looking to upgrade uh, is not within any of the current impact fee areas, so it's not eligible for that. Gotcha. So essentially, we're just taking the risk of uh, during powder outage some kind of incident while we while we wait for another buddy here. Yes, this this will really enable us to be able to be much more responsive in terms of fire police arriving on the scene. That's not to say we won't be able to secure those intersections. It will just be done kind of the old-fashioned way, if you will, until we can get them upgraded. Got it. Um, and then um, looking at the community services budget, they they are. Looks like they're planning to do a um, some kind of work in a couple of years on the middle school renovation, but it looks like we're deferring the the study that would help plan for that. Yeah, this is in coordination with the school department. Uh, there's two fields: the softball and the uh, and the baseball field that they're they're considering uh, reversing uh, for reasons I can't quite articulate. But it will really maximize efficiencies and make uh, more usable field space. Um, this was something that came up at uh, the Finance Committee and, and was decided that uh, in these circumstances we could do without. But it's really a, a project in concert with the school department. Um, and then reading through the uh, justification for the uh, Walker mower with bagger, there, there was something where we could do some of the mowing that we're currently contracting out. Do we have any kind of idea of how that, the, the kind of, I'm sure the payback period isn't a single year, but. What, what the impact is of not doing that ourselves. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't be that definitive no. to the request. Um, uh, what's certainly true is uh, under uh, Todd Souza's leadership, we're trying to take in uh, more and more of these uh, services in-house that, uh, that were prior contracted services. Uh, this isn't directly related, but an example of that is the organic program. We're trying to do more and more of that in-house uh, so as to control those costs. Uh, and then the last one, I just was hoping to get uh, an answer on this, the 4x4 the four four, uh, truck with a plow. It looks like it's a, uh, a 2005 uh, truck that has been used for, for plow duty. Are we just, what's the rationale? Yeah, our, uh, our maintenance uh, technicians have advised us that it's nearing end of life and will we'll start costing us some money. And so we've learned to, to listen to them fairly carefully. So. <coughs> Um, I think we can probably make it another year, but uh, we may, in fact, have to do uh, some some cost of repairs. We'll do what needs to be done to keep keep the vehicle on the road. Uh, there is one other vehicle that uh, for community services uh, that is in the budget that we'll proceed with. 
That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Other comments? So, I guess hearing that, then, if, if we can come back to me. Sorry. Yes. I guess hearing that, I... I <laughs> Bounced right back to you. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to see if anyone else wanted to jump in. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> so, it, it sounds like, then, we're, we're pretty pretty well aligned on, on these deferrals, and, and uh, we're, we're comfortable with them. The, the explanation sounds reasonable. So, I'm, I'm, I can support it. Uh, just clarification question. So, the motion was to make the adjustments and reduce those expenditures by the $204,000 and change. Correct. Um, did it also include adding the 350000 I just yes. want to make sure, yes. um, as yes. the liability relating yes. to the tax abatement, tax uh, civil case. Would you like to speak to that issue? Yes. So, um, that, then that's why. I, I think people need to understand a couple of things. Uh, first of all, when you look at this budget, there are really three ranges of opportunity to evaluate it. You have, an opt um, you have three levels of optimism, you have three levels of mid-range, and then you have three levels of cautiousness, depending upon what the valuation is. The key to this um, is this $350,000 liability that um, we wish wouldn't have to be in there that deals with the tax appeal case that is before the Superior Court now, mm -hmm. and the fact that we have um, um, taxpayers who, were, who lost $14,000 that they were wrongfully taxed that are getting an award in excess of $750,000 for a $14,000 loss, and we have to include that $350,000 liability to offset what we've already paid. That needs to be remembered in this process. Yeah, so the audience will understand. <clears throat> this $350,000 is being set aside. Uh, it's not going anywhere. It's a, it's a reserve figure uh, because we have a potential liability in this litigation that's pending and has been pending now for several years. Uh, and it's correct that the amount of actual loss is about $14,000. But we've already paid out $463,000 as a result of liability risk that we felt existed uh, based on the decisions at the Supreme Court. And now the case is back before the Board of Assessment Review. <clears throat> I don't like setting aside money in reserve accounts because what you're doing is you're taxing people right. now uh, and it may not co ever come to pass. This is not something that we owe. It's something that we might owe uh, if the litigation goes against us in the future. Uh, and I feel pretty strongly about the litigation. Uh, as do others on this council. Uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, some people would claim it's good accounting to set it aside. I don't like to charge people for something that they could leave town uh, next year and they would have been taxed for this and they get no benefit uh, because it might not be paid out for years, if ever. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of it, but uh, you need to compromise some, uh, some things uh, to get a budget agreement, and this is one of them. And it came out of the Finance Committee, uh, and I think on a unanimous recommendation, and I'm prepared to accept that. Uh, but it doesn't mean I like it. Uh, uh, and it skews the budget. When you, when you put 350000 that may never go anywhere into a budget uh, uh, as an appropriation, uh, uh, that starts to blow it up. We have a town-wide revaluation in this budget of $369,000. We haven't had a town-wide revaluation for residential properties in 12 years. So every 12 years we do it, and now we're putting it in this budget. So when people start to throw numbers around, and uh, figures lie and liars figure, and, and it always seemed to me that you can always make your case for what's uh, whether you like a budget or you don't like a budget. Uh, I happen to like what we've done here. We've strategically gotten uh, a, a revaluation that we had to push hard to get. Uh, but the town manager and I have been working on this since last summer when uh, he brought to my attention the uh, uh, excesses that were developing on the commercial and industrial side. Uh, uh, but uh, his admonition was, 
unless we have a plan, uh, a assessing department, we're not going to be able to uh, uh, have a, an outside appraisal company do this work. We have to have it overseen properly. He was absolutely right. So he pushed, did a good job, got us a, a new assessor, uh, and immediately RFP'd this process. And now we're going to have a revenue stream that has legitimate reasons to be here this year that's going to drop the tax rate down to between zero and two percent or less. Uh, uh, so it's going to have a dramatically positive effect. Uh, it's a circumstance. It, deal with it. it. We had to take it into account because it's real and we took, and we took prompt advantage of the opportunity to make it real. Uh, and those are some of the some of the gripes that I have about <laughs> remarks that are made by people uh, about this budget because it's a it's an excellent budget. It's got compromises in it. Uh, and uh, Councillor Kaiser, I think in, in light of those comments, would would Peter, if you could speak to, and if if you're not if you're not comfortable, that's fine. We'll, we'll accept what what the anticipated t impact on the tax rate will be, including those changes that came out of financing, that's a piece that we ought to convey as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it is reflected in the exhibit that was attended with, with uh, the agenda, but, mm -hmm. you know, without, let's, there's, there's a whole series of numbers here, but mm -hmm. in, in our traditional methodology, if you will, if you look at the mid-range before you consider the reval, it's 4.14% would be the impact on the mill rate based on what we see in front of us. Um, we will have the conversation about the reval and again, staying with the way that we usually do it, which is the mid-range cautious, which is saying is 133, potential in, 133 million potential increase in property value. Um, that rate comes out to be 0.46%. I just want to pivot to just just go right ahead. Something you'll say. I, I do want to point out. It is a good point that there is a reason that we did put the three hundred fifty thousand in there. I, I understand the, the chair's comments. The other side of the coin is in case the court does decide and the bill came due, we were concerned about. We've been pretty conservative financially trying to manage it would have an impact on our bond rating potentially it doesn't necessarily mean it would but if we had a dip into reserves to pay a liability it could impact bond ratings which we are concerned about as we see down the pike um, some pretty significant capital infrastructure we may need to do so as being cautious um, it gets to bill we may never pay it if we don't pay it it goes into reserves and it will come back to taxpayers but it, it will come back to this point, but it is, it is important to know that alone had an impact of about 0.6% on the budget, that one item. So it is, it is significant. Um, so just with that, I guess I'll leave it, leave it at that. And if there are any other questions or comments? Other comments? Okay. Um, I do have some concerns overall, but we're gonna, when we get back to the main motion, we'll discuss those. Uh, but I do appreciate the work that the Finance Committee did, and I, and I totally support the reasoning behind why they felt the need to put that 350 back in there, and so I'll, I'll support that amendment, um, and then we'll get back to the main motion later. Thank you. Other comments? Councilor Bay uh, Just briefly, I, I think it's important to also note that there are other adjustments within that list and not just on the items that Council Rowan, because there were some uh, fine-tuning of other estimates that were given to us, including an increase in um, one revenue stream re regarding main revenue source. So um, it was looked at very thoroughly by staff to find adjustments that were prudent. Thank you. Uh, this is the main motion as amended by the uh, motion from the Finance Committee. Uh, ready to vote. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Uh, the motion, uh, the main motion is now amended. Uh, and I'll accept uh, motions for any further amendments that a councillor wishes to make. Can I make, can I make a comment before we? Certainly. Um, so w one thing you said that I just wanted to clarify was you mentioned that, that um, uh, revenue stream um, in relation to the, um, to the revaluation. Um, and I just wanted to point out that the revenue, whatever, whatever budget we pass, the, the revenue that we're generating by tax dollars 
um, is what, what we pass. So right now, uh, on the table, it's $65,891,542. Um, it doesn't change as a result of the valuation. The only impact that, that uh, whatever the valuation has is just how it's shared and how it's distributed. Um, so to uh, Ms. Hamill's point, the, uh, the commercial sector has been underpaying uh, as a result of their property valuations having gone up over the last 12 years since the last town line valuation. Um, and so this valuation was revaluation uh, specific to the commercial sector is just justified to say that, that now their property value uh, will potentially increase up to, uh, I believe, if it was 75, um, so if they're at 75% of market rate, it would be up to, uh, I think, 221 million uh, is what we, um, what was calculated. Um, and so the number that we that we are looking at here was kind of taking that mid range and that and that cautious uh, optimism, but the the intent is there's one set of revenues that we're raising and then we divide that by the valuation um, so that we can determine how that gets split up so that everybody pays their fair share um, and that sets our mill rate and so it's really the mill rate um, that is impacted by the valuation not any kind of revenues. And and just so you'll understand in in May of each year, you're dealing with guesstimates. They're just projections. We don't know what the final assessment figure will be. That occurs when the tax assessor uh, uh, makes a commitment to a tax rate in August of each year. And at that moment, then we will know what uh, the actual tax impact of the budget has uh, on the community. So that's uh, it's always difficult dealing with projections, but uh, that's the timetable we're stuck with. Uh, Katie. Um, further further motion. I, I, I need to make a correction when, when Chris um, asked what would the impact be on the budget of the amendment we just approved. I w we've got four tax sheets in front of us. I went off oh. the wrong <laughs> tax sheet. So I just want to correct the record. The cautious with the $133 million would be a 1.44% increase my error so I just wanted to correct with the record thank and, you and just that sorry just so I clear that was what the recommendation was that came out of the finance committee yes thank you I apologize I'm, I'm sorry I'm showing 0.91 on on my sheet he's using costs no, no, he's oh, the oh you're, he's, he's looking we, okay yeah. I see yeah, that's the one we we, we, right. we, we but you determined you wanted to, we to recommend cautious. okay so we're, uh, we have an amended motion, uh, and now any further amendments that councillors wish to make uh, can be made at this time. Recognize Councillor Foley. Thank you. Um, so I do have a couple of amendments, and we'll split them up, uh, and just some quick background and context for, for everybody in terms of why I'm making these amendments. Uh, I, I personally feel very responsible um, for passing this budget on the first time around. Uh, I think it's, it's no secret that I believe in order to pass the budget on the first round, we absolutely have to be as close to that 3% overall tax rate increase as possible. Uh, at the first reading, we were looking at approximately 4.19%, and now we're up to 4.42%. Um, and given all the division in town uh, already, I absolutely want passing the budget on the first round and with as little division as possible to be our number one goal. I do understand and appreciate why the numbers have changed since our first reading. I also understand uh, that some of us may believe that using the commercial revaluation will get us uh, well below our goal of 3%, but to my way of thinking, the relief that's offered by the revaluation is really intended to address the inequities of fair payment uh, and be returned directly back to the taxpayers, not to be used for plugging holes or bridging gaps in our current budget. So I'm also a firm believer that if you oppose something, as oh, I am Foley, likely... Would you make the motion first, and then I'll recognize you to sure. justify the Hold that thought. I'll motion. come right back to that <laughs> spot in my narrative. Uh, so the first amendment would be a motion to move approval to amend the main motion as amended to reduce the municipal budget by an additional $177,000 in the areas shown below, resulting in a new gross municipal operating budget of thirty-four million two hundred and forty-six thousand six hundred and fifty-two. And would you like to summarize the items? That I'll second that for purposes of discussion. Thank you. Okay. 
So basically, uh, in summarization, I, you know, a couple of things that stood out to me immediately were um, uh, staff increases, to be honest. And one of them was mentioned this evening, uh, an increase of 24.6%. There was another one that was at 32.8%. So it got me thinking, uh, what would it look like if we potentially uh, held kind of everybody to the same, so everybody still gets their increase or, or cost of living increase. Um, but if we held the line on that for a year, what would that do for us? Uh, and that's kind of in the spirit of, of where this amendment is coming from, and that's where the, those dollar amounts came from. So going back to what, my narrative, yes. <laughs> just quickly. Please proceed. Uh, so I'm just also a firm believer that if you oppose something, you must also offer a solution or an alternative, which is the spirit of my amendment this evening. Uh, I don't want to simple, simply vote no on the proposed budget as it is and wanted to demonstrate that while we may not like the choices in front of us, and I want to be very clear on this, I don't like these choices either, um, but there is in fact a way for us to get closer to that starting goal of 3% or lower without cutting staff positions on either the municipal or the school side of the budget. I also understand that Julie and Tom, as the leaders uh, and decision makers of those two sides of the coin, might choose to make a different cut than I might point out because they see different priorities. I respect their right to do so. However, it needs to be clearly articulated that those are indeed choices uh, that can be made. It does not have to be achieved through staff reduction. So I would just encourage my fellow counselors to at least consider what a compromise like this might do for us as a town in terms of going a long way to get this budget passed the first time around. I think we would all agree that reliving the multiple votes of last summer would be a nightmare. And I believe the budget as it is without some of these amendments could indeed fail which again is why I offer these amendments this evening. Um, and believe me, this is a situation in which I would be happy to be wrong, but I feel the budget as is would fail. So that's, first motion is on the table. Second. Thank you. Uh, discussion? Councilor Rowan. Yeah, I think, I, I guess I don't have a basis to, to believe that the budget will be any more likely to pass <coughs> with this cut mm -hmm. than without. Um, and so I'm, I'm not going to support this. Um. So um, I do think it's important that the details of the motion also be shared. So I, I'm just going to kind of break it down based on the four, five, four groups. So um, what's being recommended is a net reduction of $41,500 out of benefits for non-union merit and salary adjustments, $25,000 for the finance department's request for a full-time clerk for a full-time clerk, um, a new inspector, fire inspector position in the planning department for 83,500. Keep in mind that most of those numbers include salary and benefits, so that's why it's higher than normal, and it's based upon the, f uh, the budgeting practice that you have to assume that you might have to pay out the most on the, on the, on the, uh, on the uh, benefit side. And then under contracted services, assessing is $27,000. There is a footnote, um, I'm assuming that maybe the manager put in there that said that if the finance clerk position is removed, that in essence you would have to put back in a part-time position and increase overtime. So the, really the net result of that is only a $3,000 adjustment. Is that right, Tom? Yeah, I, I must admit I was scurrying to put this together and I want to make sure I wasn't missing something. So uh, I, I believe that is the, the actual effect if we wish to restore back to current okay. situation. So if I can further just on a comment, please. Um, I, I agree with Council Rowan. I'm not sure. Um, in fact, I, I'm almost um, in disbelief that a hundred and seventy seven thousand dollar adjustment is going to move the community um, to yes. I think the community is actually going to be at yes already. Um, and the uh, secondary challenge that I have because it focuses really on um, employment, hiring um, needs, you know, um, and I, I hope this isn't a surprise. I, I, I saw it today because I saw our job posting. We're losing a staff employee. We're losing a very qualified sustainability coordinator who is um, going to another company because they pay more. So as we think about who we are hiring, retaining, the skills that they bring, the quality of services to attack these type of um, adjustments um, when we have more needs, um, let alone you think about other needs uh, when we talk about enforcing ordinances, um, I, I don't think this is the right approach. Thank you. Other comments, Councillor Caterino. Uh, yeah, I, I'm looking at this and going, we didn't even see these until 3:45 this afternoon is when it was posted, and I didn't see it till almost five because I work. 
Um, and I'm, I'm concerned about that because we do have an informal agreement, so to speak, on this council that if there are amendments, particularly to budget items, they'll give them to us in advance so we can at least have a chance to digest them. Um, so through, through the chair, if I could ask the chair of the finance committee a question. Yeah. Um, were these changes ever discussed in the finance committee? That we, as the finance committee, we had conversations about many of these items. It was what was reported out as the recommendation of the finance committee was the consensus view of the things that we felt were in the first motion. That's where we had consensus. We talked about some of these other things. <clears throat> People are in different places. We didn't include them on the, on the list, if, if that answers your question. Uh, well, okay. And um, <coughs> yes or no. Uh, and again, I agree with, with the previous two speakers that 177000 is not going uh, <coughs> to, that's not going to, on the municipal side, isn't going to make any difference in the, in the, in the vote. So I would not support this at all. Councilor Gaza. You know, so um, while I, I, I can appreciate the sentiment and the spirit behind making such suggestions, this is actually the first time I have seen them. Uh, so uh, I'm very concerned that they haven't had an opportunity to be fully vetted and discussed. And while I, I would concur with Peter to some extent that the overall budget was discussed in finance, these particular line items have a significant impact in specific areas that we did not discuss and that we haven't had an opportunity to vet and determine what the consequences would be to those areas. So I'm always very, very hesitant to make, uh, I guess, arbitrary last minute decisions based on a spreadsheet without being able to fully vet the impact that these changes would have on the budget in other areas because it, it, it is a very, very complex budget. Uh, and when you pull on a certain string somewhere, it unravels somewhere else. And that's why we work on this from November until today and, and beyond, because of the complexities of it. And I, I think waiting in, until this particular moment to address these issues, I think, is, is probably not the right approach. Um, I also have some concern with some of the comments that are being made around the tax increase. Or the the uh, percentage tax increase. I've heard a couple saying, now we're doing comparisons of including valuation or not including valuation. While that may be something to discuss, finance looked at that, we discussed it, we debated it, we put that in our recommendation. And the bottom line is that the tax increase based on what came out of the finance committee will be in a range from 0.39 to 1.44. That's the increase that you would pay based on the recommendations that we came up with. So I'm very concerned, especially with comments that we're putting out there. We've had a lot of issues in the past with differing numbers and competing numbers, and I think it's very critical and very important that we all agree that the budget that's being presented right now with the reductions includes the valuation because we did debate that and we did vet that and we did include that. If we want to then now have a debate on whether we should include that valuation process or not, that's something different than stating it's a 4.3% increase versus a 1.44% increase. So um, I think we just need to be a little cautious about that and we need to be very careful of how we frame our arguments. So I, I won't support this. Um, I, I'm not saying that these weren't areas that could have been looked at. It would have been nice to have these um, to look at from finance so we could have vetted them in the department meetings. And I, I think... Uh, with a little bit more uh, foresight and, 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 and planning, we could, have, we could have addressed those details head on and, and had the uh, opportunity to, to, to vet them. So I, I can't support it. I'm sorry. Further uh, discussion on the motion to amend? Uh, I just wanted to respond to a couple of things. Um, and one, it's, it's uh, so I would agree with some of the comments that, you know, by, the, by itself, 177000 is not going to necessarily get there. As you will see when I uh, go forward with the next amendment that I will offer, combined, uh, what it would do potentially would give us, when we look at those, the three ranges that we look at, so optimistically it would be a 3.1%. 3.11, which I know is not 3% or below, but it's as close as we could get, a mid-range of 3.66, and then a cautious of 4.23. I do feel like with that uh, combined was potentially my goal of getting us passed in the first uh, time. I also just want to address the concerns just so that the community is aware, because I 100% hear 
what my fellow counselors are saying about uh, the late arrival of these ideas and thoughts. Um, uh, I had some extreme uh, personal family circumstances this past week. Uh, my sister ended up in an emergency surgery uh, and has been uh, in the hospital for four days. And then I've been primary caregiver to her, her two businesses, her daughter, her two dogs, while her father-in-law passed away as well. So uh, my time has been extremely limited. And yes, I should have been on it even further time ago, granted. Uh, but that is, in fact, the reality of my situation and why these amendments were not able to get into your hands earlier. I did have uh, these ideas and thoughts, just did not have the opportunity to discuss them uh, properly. So I apologize for that. Further comments? Councilor Hayes. Yeah, and I guess, you know, I can only speak for myself, but, but, but sort of, and there have been a bunch of comments tonight, but I can only speak for myself. When we started this process, in November and our goal setting. For me, I was always at, I always understood when we said our goal was to pass the budget on the first read and that we would not support a budget over 3%. I, I was not aware that revaluation was on the table. Um, that didn't come forward to us as a, as a town council until midwinter, January, February. So when I committed myself to 3%, I wasn't thinking a reval. Um, when we had the first read, um, everybody at this table committed to no more than a 3% increase. We didn't mention the reval, only, only one big reference was made to it. So for me, I made a commitment that I wouldn't support anything more than a 3% increase. Um, and so I can let others speak to what, what when we had the first read, what that 3% meant to them, but at least for me, that's what it meant for me. And I thought when we had these conversations, what we got when we got to the place that we're at, that the only place we could go from what we just approved in the first motion was the only thing on the table would be positions, both at the municipal level or the school level. This at least gives some ways that we can get to, to, that, to about 3%. I go back to the 350 that we added for the lawsuit adds 0 0.6. So we're, we're basically at that number. We don't think it involves any layoffs of staff. We think there's a way that this will deliver to our community what they expect of us. I think it's really important that we pass this budget on the first on the first read. Um, this community needs to heal. We need to start down that pathway. Um, I'm really concerned that you know you, you kind of heard it from the podium tonight from others. I think that is the expectation. I think if we don't pass it on the first read. It's going to be a really challenging summer. Um, <clears throat> that's where I, I, I kind of am. Um, so I, I think these are reasonable. Um, and I'll, I'll just leave you. And I, I kind of, um, I'm, a, I'm a movie fan, but there was a Japanese <coughs> ad admiral in the 1970 film, Tora, was attributed with a comment of saying, I fear all we have done is awaken a sleeping giant. We have a community that is very, very engaged. They're watching us. They're holding us accountable to things that we say and do. And I, I just think that we need to try to deliver on June 12th a number that we can get passed at the polls. I think you heard some folks tonight say they would pass a 3% budget. I think that's an important piece for, for us to consider. Councilor Kaiser. Yeah, and, I, and I, I, I can empathize with my fellow counselor here where his position is, and certainly it was discussed in, in finance, and I thought we had a, a, a very robust debate about it. I guess I, I, my approach is that, um, you know, very much like we have to take into consideration potential shortcomings and shortfalls in a budget, I think we also have an obligation to take into account potential benefits to a budget. That's part of planning. You can't only plan for negative. You have to plan for positive as well. So um, while I can appreciate the, the sentiment that um, more is always better, um, I, I, I fear that we're, we're in a situation, I think, to quote the former, uh, for, uh, a quote from Councillor Rowan in the past, that we're, we want great to get in the way of good. Um, I think this is a very responsible budget, and I think at the end of the day, the, the impact to taxpayers will be, at most, we're anticipating 1.44%. That's one of the lowest tax increases that we've had in a very, very long time. And by the way, one of our other precedents that we often like to, to tout in finance is first do no harm. 
You know, we don't want to start deconstructing programs and projects and, and positions at the expense of a, a, a few thousands of dollars or ten thousand dollars. We're talking about, um, you know, maintaining level services, and that's always been a, a key criteria. So while I, I can, again, I, I think it's a simplistic approach to say these are areas that won't affect staffing and don't uh, affect programming and that we can simply make these reductions and it's an easy fix. I think if it were an easy fix, we would have identified them from November moving forward and made those adjustments. So I think there's a lot of, of uh, downside to pushing a, 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 an approach like this at the last minute. So again, I, I just want to be, you know, I, I want to reiterate the fact that from my perspective, valuation has been discussed. It's a real thing. It should be taken into consideration. And at the end of the day, the check that you people are going to have to write and we're going to have to write is going to be 1.4% higher than it was last year. And I think that's a pretty good, pretty good conclusion considering where we're at. Councilor Rowan. Yeah, Councilor Hayes made some statements about first read that I, um, that I was concerned was putting words in my mouth. At, at first read, I, I said that a 3% increase would be um, from our current tax rate of 16.49, uh, a 3% increase would be 49 cents. Um, and uh, I believe that uh, that would take us up to um, 16.98. I think we're going to be well short of that. I, I wasn't privy, wasn't participating in the um, Finance Committee's debate when they um, made the recommendation of the, the number to use for, for evaluation uh, next year. I think that really that based on the uh, background documentation that the town manager shared, um, that uh, we could see the uh, commercial reval come in considerably higher than, than um, uh, what we're using here with 133. And then in the past, we haven't really specified whether or not we were going to uh, determine that we were going to use the cautious uh, optimate um, range. Um, the point of that policy was to try and get as accurate as possible with um, our projections of valuation because we've based our goals on tax rate. And we don't know what the tax rate is going to be because we don't know what the assessment will be. Um, so I think that, um, that in that spirit, um, I think that in that spirit, um, we, we could see a tax rate that has a much lower impact uh, when we're actually looking at what reality is than, than the number that we've given. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, I mean, a couple things. One, you know, I think as, as a finance committee, we did ask for any documentation that would support the estimates of these, these valuations. Um, usually, as you know, we've always said, we can't tell the tax assessor what to come up with a value. That's an independent process that plays out in August. We have started the reevaluation. We asked at finance for a testament from either the tax testament from either the, the tax assessor or our consultant doing the work. The document that we all got yesterday, what we have here is a listing of 22 properties that have sold since 2016 to present. With a there are some that sold for more than the assessed value, some that sell for less. We're using that overall ratio for 22 properties to say that's going to estimate where all the commercial properties come out. That makes me really uncomfortable. I'll remind all of us last year, we had a surprise at the reevaluation that caused the ending tax rate to be half a percent higher. So I think, you know, in my second piece around revaluation, I heard it tonight, I always thought revaluation was it is a way the commercial payers have overpaid. Um, residential, I mean, have underpaid. The residential property on owners have overpaid. It's supposed to be revenue neutral. It's not supposed to be used to fund additional expenditures. It's just a matter of, you know, if, if commercial properties pay in a dollar, the resident residents should get a dollar back. And what we're doing is we're using part of the revaluation dollars to artificially lower the effective tax rate at the end of the day. We, we may, we can argue that that's the right thing to do, but I think recent events should really indicate to us, I'm not sure our constituents that we want to come out to the poll on June 12th are going to look at it through that same filter. And that's just something for us to think about. Councilor Gazo. So, so, so two points. Um, I don't think the revaluation 
makes a number artificially lower. I think it's, it, it, it impacts it. That's not an artificial number. Uh, but we don't know what the number is. We, we don't, and we, and we often don't. But I think we're, that, that's to Councillor Rowan's point of why we created that policy in the first place, was to give us a, it's a, meant to be a tool, to give us some guidelines. And that's why we have a range, and we agree to look at different variables in it. So, I, I, I mean, I'd love to have a crystal ball and, and get a definitive number and set that tax rate, and we'd end all this discussion right now. But the fact of the matter is we are dealing with an intangible and an unknown until it happens after the fact. So in the past, we've been, that's why we have the conservative range, and I think that's why we, we landed in that, that middle ground dur during our discussions. In terms of generating revenue, I, I, again, I want to defer to Councillor Rowan's response. We're not generating any revenue here. Mm. We're not receiving a windfall of $175 million, I think was a number I saw out in public somewhere. If we got $175 million in revenue, guys, this conversation doesn't even exist. You know, we could take a couple years off and not worry about it. That's not what's happening. We're, you know, the, the whole point of the valuation is the effect on the tax rate, not the cash flow or the revenue into the town. So we have to keep that in mind. This isn't like we're, we, we've, we're stumbling on a pot of money somewhere, we've dug up a bunch of coins in the backyard. It's, it is a normal process, it's a normal procedure that all municipalities go through. I think it's prudent for us to take it into account and, and manage that and plan for it moving forward, and I think we've done that. Uh, I would point out that we uh, approved the reval in January. Everyone knew about it. Everyone knew the significance of it. Uh, the idea that this wasn't part of the budget analysis is revisionist history. Let's, let's stop kidding ourselves about that. Everyone knew this was part of the deal. It was a new set of facts that had to be taken into account because for us not to take it into account would be to distort the whole budget process. So uh, please. Uh, and uh, the estimate itself, uh, if you have comparable sales of 22 as your analysis, uh, uh, appraisers and assessors will tell you that's a lot of comps. Uh, uh, and uh, so it's not a small margin. Uh, and the estimate that's being used for the purposes of trying to predict what the outcome will be, so voters will know, is taking less than half that figure. As Councillor Kayser pointed out, it could be as high as $221 million in increased assessed value. And what we're doing is we're down at $100 million, $133 million, uh, so that we're using an extremely conservative number. And the consequence is we get uh, a tremendous uh, benefit to the residential taxpayers of this town. Further comments? We're dealing with a motion to amend, the amended main motion. Uh, ready to vote? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Oh, sorry. Opposed? Oh, you're a fool me. Oh, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> nice I recognize try. Councillor uh, Foley for any further uh, motions. Yeah, so uh, I guess what I would say is that to offer the second amendment um, will be a little bit amiss because without the support of the First Amendment, I, it doesn't really get us to where I was trying to get us, which was the 3.11% potential. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and offer it because I do think for uh, points of discussion, it's important uh, to recognize that um, it wouldn't be, uh, it's prudent to, you know, we have to look at both sides. And so anyway, so, so my next amendment would be a motion to move approval to amend the main motion as amended to reduce the education budget by $300,000, resulting in a new gross education operating budget of 49,900, I need new glasses, or I need glasses, 963,320. Um, and going back to my original comments around uh, not, going towards the staff cut piece. We, as a council, we, we don't have a purview to say to the school board any piece of uh, line item. Um, but my suggestion would be that there are some reserves the schools could use to get there. And If uh, I may yeah. ask for a second. Oh, sorry. Second. Yep. Thank you. You have the floor. Apologize. No, I always no forget problem. that part. You have the floor. <laughs> um, so in order to, people say, well, Katie, how, how can we 
cut the 300,000 without making that a staff reduction. And the ideas that I would propose, would have proposed to the school uh, board to look at would be delaying the tech refresh potentially another year. I know it's not something they would want to do, um, but it's a possibility and it wouldn't result in a staff cut. Um, and then also some combination of uh, using reserve funds. So uh, again, I don't expect that this will pass because without the first one, it doesn't really accomplish that goal that I set out of getting us to a place where I think the overall package will pass uh, at, on June 12th. But I did for discussion purposes feel, since I put it out to you this afternoon, um, it was important to put out there. A discussion on the uh, uh, motion to amend. Councilor Kazem. So I, I also will not support this amendment for the same reasons that I didn't support the original amendment. Um, I, I would also caution that even if we are making suggestions, uh, we have to be very, very cautious mm -hmm. of making suggestions to what areas should be reduced. We have a legal obligation to not interfere with the school budget. That's one of the reasons we have the joint finance committee meetings so that we can discuss those issues um, and, and talk about the impacts of potential cuts and reductions or improvements. And um, we did discuss uh, what a $300,000 reduction would look like to the school budget. And uh, the response I believe we got from the superintendent was it will result in staff reductions. That's their prerogative. Whether we agree with that or not, um, that would be their decision to make. And I'm, I'm always leery of putting an arbitrary number out there, assuming that we have the ability to dictate where that would come from. So I, I can't support it. Further comment? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about um, where we are. So um, in fiscal year 2017, that was my first year on the council, we had the, the Wentworth bond premium, um, which uh, we had overborrowed for, for the uh, Wentworth school. We had to use those funds, um, obligated to use those funds to pay back um, Wentworth um, bonds uh, for the, for the um, uh, the debt associated with Wentworth. It also created uh, the bond surplus, or excuse me, the uh, fund balance surplus from last year um, uh, in the budget in fiscal year 18, uh, which was then used to pay the Wentworth uh, uh, debt associated with it. Um, and now we're in fiscal year 2019, so it's the first year where we've really been impacted and we didn't have another revenue stream to pay for Wentworth, which was approved by the voters um, back in 2015 or 2014, I don't recall. Um, we also, this is the first year that we've seen the impact of the public safety building, which was also approved um, by the voters. We also have a one-time um, um, charge in fiscal year 19 budget of, um, uh, for the town-wide revalue that we're gonna be doing in the next year. We also have included $350,000 for um, assessment um, excuse me, to the overlay to pay for uh, the lawsuits uh, or potential liability for, the, for those lawsuits. And I guess what I would say is that it, it feels like we're, we are, um, in order to meet our, our 3% um, or some machination of, of the 3%, um, we're really putting it out there on, on the backs of the um, school department. Um, when, when they have already put forth a pretty minimal budget that had the, the smallest uh, gross increase um, in years from the first read. And I just don't think that that's appropriate and uh, won't support it. Others? Comments Yeah, I think just a couple of points of clarity. And putting aside the reval, that there may be differences of feeling, but I just want us to come back to maybe focus. The total net budget increase this year that we're talking about is 5.56%, taking out but just as a frame of reference to We'll just kind of, uh, I understand about the reval being in there, but don't forget we also have $514,000 of bond premium income from the school that kind of negates the impact of the reval, so that's kind of a wash. There is the 350 that we accrued, so I think it's just important to- From the make, public safety building? Yeah, so, yeah from the gotcha. bond. So it just, Fair. those washed, so it's really not a, a net, net impact. Um, so again, I, I think, we can sit here and try to convince ourselves that this is a fair budget, but I'm not sure what we're, we're, we're factoring in is what are we hearing from our constituents that are sitting out there? What is their expectation? What do they expect us to deliver 
um, to the community as a budget they can support. I think we need to really think about that. I'm really nervous. You know, I, I, I'm pretty sure we've, we've heard from, from quite a few that, that anything over 3% um, without, again, if they define it without the rebound. And so that's just my perspective. I, I, I really worry that this is going to, this will pass on June 12th. Councilor Gazin. So, I, and I, I, again, I, I, I just want to point out, um, Councilor Hayes is accurate that okay. the budget increase is a 5.56% budget increase, but our goal was the tax rate increase. So I, I, I'd hate to see people running around in town now saying the budget's gone up 5.56%, and that's what the tax rate's going to be. I know you're not suggesting that. No, that, that's our expenditures I, and, went up. Yes. 5.5. Yes, it's that's, unsustainable. We just and, can't. But that's another, that's a different discussion. Our goals never centered around a 3% expenditure increase. And I know there was some confusion, and we've, we've kind of gone round and round about that in finance. The, the goal of the council was never an expenditure increase of 3% or less. It was the overall tax increase of 3% or less, and that's the bill that we give to the, to the citizens to pay for it. So I, I'm not disagreeing with your, with your, your point, Peter. I, yeah. it, it is, it's a valid point. That's, that's the number. But I just want to be clear, that's not the, that's, that was never our goal, and that's not what no, the tax right. increase is going to be. Okay? So I, I, I'd hate to see signs show up some point saying 5.5 or 6% increase, don't vote for it, um, because it's the tax rate that we're, that we're setting. Councilor Foley. Um, do you want to go to Councilor Katerina? I, I forgot my thought. Sure. I, I'm, Councilor Katerina. Oh, everyone knows that I'm not a math genius, um, but I was just sitting here, I'm looking here, and I'm going, well, under the amendments proposed by Councilor Foley, we're looking at a, you know, under the cautious, a 1657 for the mill rate, and other under, under the one that's the finance committee came out with its 1673 mill rate and uh, on a three hundred thousand dollar house that's a difference of well Mr. Hall and I came out with two different numbers between forty and forty eight dollars a year difference we're talking about here folks a year difference between the two numbers so keep it in perspective I remembered go ahead um, so I, I just, you know, again, kind of to Peter's point, whether we believe it or not, the perception becomes reality. And the, the narrative out there has been that we always seem to find this golden parachute. And, uh, you know, if we were at that 3% and, and the revaluation comes back as high as we think it has potential to, that we could actually make history and be uh, a negative uh, on the text. And wouldn't that be incredible and I, I guess I just don't when I look at that I don't think that's a terrible uh, thing um, I, I respect what everyone has said tonight and I'm, I didn't necessarily anticipate but I, I do hope people can at least appreciate my spirit of uh, wanting to pass the budget on the first time and I, and I, I truly hope that I'm wrong I, I, I want to be wrong um, that's the truth so yeah, I think uh, I would love to have see a negative increase in, in the tax rate, and I think that there are, is a, a path forward, even shown on this sheet, that, that suggests that, that we could see that depending on how the valuations come out. And I, I believe that everyone wants to see the tax rate be as low as possible. I just think that there are, that we still need to be responsible and eat our vegetables and pass pass the budgets. No broccoli, <laughs> including your broccoli. And Councilor Baby, lime <clears throat> beans. So, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to keep my comments only to the amendment around the three hundred thousand. Um, the net impact overall on both amendments that have been provided doesn't get us to the goal that has been suggested that we need to be at 3% or lower. Uh, it simply gets us to a more comfortable position for some people. Um, I would rather see us remove the $350,000 in liability accrual rather than cutting our educational system that needs it so badly. I would too. I'll second that. I mean, you got to make the amendment. No, I think that we made the, we made the right decision. I hate it, I don't like it, but I, I think we made that, that we made that decision. Other comments? I, uh, I will tell you how I look at budgets. Two ways. I start by saying, is it efficient? Is it uh, is it tight? Is it effective? Are 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 are, are we uh, from last year? 
have we gone off on some grandiose plan of expansion or new personnel or new programs? And if that's not there, I go, that's a pretty tight budget. And from the moment I saw the school budget, I said, that's a pretty tight budget. They have a 2.9% increase from last year's costs to this year's costs. Think about it, 70% of, uh, of their costs are personnel, so, and they're mostly union. So when you get finished negotiating with the union, you've got at least a 2% year uh, per year increase. And by the way, comments earlier about uh, our paying these grandiose increases, we studied that issue. Uh, uh, in recent years. We are below all the other co uh, communities that we would compare ourselves to in teacher salaries. So we're trying to make it up uh, uh, in little increments each year in this three-year contract that we're presently in the middle of for our teachers. Uh, uh, that, so that's the way I start to look at this. I go, my, my God, they're, they're keeping it 2% increase plus step increases, and then you go, what's the, what, are, what are the other killers? Well, health insurance. Now, they had budgeted in here 5%. You go, 5%? When are we ever gonna see health insurance uh, premiums start to uh, get back towards what everyone expects is a cost of living increase? One and a half, 2% cost of living increase for health insurance. Well, then they came back at the end of the process and said, well, that 5% was wrong. It's 7.2%. That's another $110,000 added on to the budget. And the proposal that we have in front of us says, well, you're, you're going to have to eat because there were other changes and they all came out to, uh, uh, to the, on the bad side from the school's budget point of view of $47,000. And the finance committee uh, and the proposal before us says, eat that $47,000, just so you'll know the, the school's doing its part. So when I look at it, I go, my God, this is great news. We've got a school that is being disciplined. Would they like to be able to add? They've got a long, long list of things that they would do. The leadership group, the superintendent's office, there's all sorts of things that they think they could do to improve our school system. Uh, but they just sucked it up and said, no, this is, and you don't make friends being the town manager or the superintendent having to tell department heads, no. Uh, and, and you can ask any of our chiefs, you can ask them, is he tough on it? Is the superintendent tough to be able to bring this in? Absolutely tough. Uh, and that's why I absolutely would never support this because this is a terrific school budget. Uh, and for all the reasons that I've already said, the town budget is equally uh, excellent. So, my two cents. Uh, any further comments? Uh, that we are voting on a motion uh, to amend the main motion to uh, cut the school's budget by $300,000. All in favor? Opposed? Uh, any further amendments to the uh, uh, main motion? Uh, any further discussion that anyone would like to have concerning the, ma the main motion? Just a closing comment. I think that, um, first, I really want to thank uh, the chairs of our finance committee, uh, Peter Hayes, represented the uh, Council and Jody Shea uh, started on the school side, and then Leanne has uh, picked up the reins in the last month or so. So uh, I really want to say thank you to all of us that have uh, served on that. It was a um, very good process, well thought out. We instituted some new um, approaches, uh, particularly around the little um, community dialogue sessions that we had in which most of us were able to host one. It was very interesting. So I do want to say thank you um, to them as well, as well as to staff. Um, every year is a crisis year. It seems we always talk about um, it's not sustainable, there's a cliff we're going to fall over. And I think that as we look at our minimal receivership in particular, um, we've been able to weather through that. It's a little been, been a little bit bumpy, 
um, but I think that we're finally through that process when, or through that um, impact um, so that we can move forward. In fact, I think it's actually better for us being a minimal receiver because um, at least we won't be getting lies out of Augusta regarding our school funding um, on a regular basis. So I do want to say thank you. I think it's really important that people look at the, some of the underlying concerns that are in this budget, particularly this year. There is the, um, the issue of the tax uh, cases, the civil cases, um, and what that does to the budget. There is, a, I think it was a million one um, reduction in revenue from the school side that we had to absorb as a result of the minimal receivership and getting us to that point. I mean, there's so many different pieces to this that really should be um, concentrated on and looked at. And the fact is that, um, and I've been one who's been hesitant over the last four years, or th yeah, four years working with Peter um, and Chris, and Chris, by the way, um, served on the school side um, when he was on the school board. You know, we're getting to this point where we consistently talk about long-range planning. We need to budget out. We need to look forward, and we need to do that type of forecasting. And I think it was Councillor Chiazzo that said earlier, that includes us looking at the positive things as well and not discounting and ignoring them. I recall when we started this process, we agreed as a finance committee that we would sit there and take a look at this budget before the revaluation and right beside it look at it after the revaluation. We did not share that we would discount it and say that it does not impact the budget. We simply agreed that we wanted to be transparent about what that was and not necessarily hide behind what an impact of that, is go that was. That's part of the long range planning and accepting what the evaluation is or come out of that process is part of the consideration. Um, and the community, I hope, accepts that and understands it um, because we are in a very good position. Um, personally, I think that while we're taking the mid range of $133 million, I think it's going to be considerably higher. I think it's going to be close to the 166. And if you look at the optimistic outcome of that, it's actually a net reduction of almost 50 basis points or uh, half a percent. New business. So, um, you know, take that into consideration. There's a lot of data, and the fact is, over time, I've learned um, a lot of people can take a lot of data and manipulate it to the way that they want to uh, fit their argument, um, and we need to be balanced in that consideration. Other comments on the main motion as amended? Ready, ready to vote? We are going to do a roll call vote. Thank you. Councillor Baybine? Yes. Councillor Rowan? Yes. Councillor Foley? No. Councillor Katarina? Yes. Councillor Hayes? No. Councilor Chiazzo? Yes. And Chairman Donovan? Yes. Uh, we have a small amount of additional uh, business to undertake. It's just after 10, so I'll accept the motion to suspend the rules. So moved. Second. Any further discussion on that? All in favor? Thank you. Order 1838, act on the recommendation to appoint Arthur Colvin of Echo, <laughs> Maine, as the representative from Scarborough to serve in the Long Creek Watershed Management District Board of Directors. Uh, uh, Scarborough has a seat on the Long Creek uh, Watershed Management District. Um, and Mr. Colvin, I believe, has been a long participant on that board, will represent our interests well, uh, and certainly recommend uh, that you consider his appointment. Uh, public comment. Seeing none, close that. Move approval. Second. Uh, discussion. Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Thank, Thank you. you. Order 1839, act on the appointment of Jean Marie Caterina to the Maine Municipal Legislative Policy Committee, the town manager. Yes, uh, we do have seats on the Legislative Policy Committee. This is the group that uh, is, is statewide representation. They really work in concert with the uh, lobbying efforts and the professional staff at Maine Municipal regarding any pending legislation. So I know Councillor Katarina has been a longstanding member of that, and uh, I've heard from colleagues she's quite effective uh, in that capacity. So we're, you should be pleased to have her representing us there. Public comment. Seeing none, I'll close that. Move that approval. Motion? Second. Uh, discussion? All in favor? Opposed? None. Uh, act on the request from the town clerk to certify the results of the special recall election that was held on Tuesday, May 8, 2018. Uh, town clerk, please. Yes. Um, pursuant to the charter section 903.8, um, I present the certification to the Town Council the results of the special recall election that was held on Tuesday, May 8th. Um, Donna Bealy, the um, 
the yes votes were 3,086, the nays was 1,496, the blanks were 14 with the total votes cast of 4,596. Carrie Lyford received uh, 3,047 yes votes, 1,535 nays, 12 blanks for a total of 4,594. Jody Shea, the yes was 3,040, the nays were 1,550, the blanks were six for a total votes cast of 4,596. Thank you. Uh, those for certification. Public comment on the matter. Accept a motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Councilor Gaza. Yeah, this isn't a debate or a discussion, but I just would like to um, personally thank Donna Bealey and uh, Carrie Lyford and Jody Shea for their service to the community. And uh, I've served with, with two of them, and I, I have the utmost respect for them, and I, I, I will continue to have that. Other comment? Yeah, I'd like to extend my thanks as well to Jody and Donna and Carrie. I know this is now they wanted uh, their, this term of their service to end, but um, they've done it with dignity and graciousness and I'm taking notes for when I get recalled. <laughs> <laughs> You'll need a couple months. Your Brother Covey, Councilor Gatorino. I would just add my thanks also without for, oops, belaboring it any further. For the comments, Councilor Bayway. Um, so, um, of course, I'd have to uh, send out my thank you to each of the women but also thank their families because uh, giving of yourself in this capacity, uh, both at the school board and town council, let alone planning board and any other committee in this town, has an incredible burden on the family because you always prioritize um, your responsibilities. And so I want to say thank you to them. I've come to know Jody in particular, um, but Donna as well, a little bit better through the finance process. And really want to say thank you for um, their contribution to changing how we used to look at our budget and where we're now kind of moving that in the direction. They were a big part of that. Other comments? Councilor Hayes. I think I just echo what everybody said. It's, it's been a rough process and their thoughts and appreciation for what they did. I'll join in that. Councilor. I, I would echo the, the comments and just say, you know, nobody runs for an office for the fame and fortune and um, service is definitely uh, a challenge and uh, I do think, given the really difficult situations, those three ladies handled themselves far better than uh, I would have, uh, quite frankly, and uh, I respect that. Further comment? Uh, seeing none, let's vote. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Standing Special Committee reports and liaison reports. Uh, start with you, Chris. Uh, so, Energy Committee met this morning. Um, we did not have enough for a quorum, so we um, unfortunately we had some discussions, but no action. We looked at um, LED streetlights, trigen update, carbon-free dividend policy. Um, we didn't really take up any new business because we didn't have a quorum, and set the next meeting. And I, I, I don't know if the manager is going to speak to that, but uh, we did. Uh, here that Carrie, um, Carrie Grantham was was moving on, and, and this was a, effectively her last energy committee meeting. But I'll let the town manager address that through his his comments. That's it. Nothing to see then. Thank you, Councilor Gettery. I'm bored. I'm looking back to see where where I've been and what I've been doing here. Um, I wanted to thank the chamber for a nice dinner. That was very nice. Uh, uh, a good. And we did have a vision committee meeting on SEDCO where we're just working on ongoing uh, issues. So I think that's it. Councilor Foley. I'll be quick. Um, just a reminder that the John Andrews 5K to support the Eastern Trail Alliance is coming up. You can find information on the Facebook page. Uh, and also my apologies to the Conservation Commission. I did end up in the emergency room, which is why I missed our meeting on Monday. So uh, I will catch up with a member of the and see what else is important to bring forward. Councilor Rowe. Nothing tonight, thank you. Councilor Bailey. Nothing. Town manager's report. I'm inclined to say nothing. Council member comments, we'll start down with Sean. Um, I have nothing, thank you. Nope. I'll be real quick, but I promised because uh, 
I don't know any of these parents and the, the girls on the high school lacrosse team. Um, those parents reached out to me immediately after my sister's accident, offering uh, help and service, and, and that was just greatly, greatly appreciated. So thanks to all those parents for reaching out. And that's it for now. Councilor Kettering. No, I'm all set, thank you. Councilor Hayes. No, I'm all set, thank you. Councilor Gaze. I have a long list of prepared comments that I will not be reading. This <laughs> um, but I will say um, congratulations to Jonathan Hayes for the Cornell uh, Book Award. Oh, right. uh, we did, uh, Councillor Hayes and I were able to attend, um, get that brief family time in before yeah. here. Uh, uh, and it's just a testament really to the, to the quality of kids we have in this community. There are some really, really sharp students uh, and, and that's, that's a very positive because that's the future of our town. So I'm, I'm, I always walk away from that a, a, with a little bit of a lighter step going. There's, there's still hope. There's still hope. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and Chris's son cleaned house. He must have gotten <laughs> 10 certificates of appreciation and awards. So that's was, wonderful. He gets that from his mother. They did a great <laughs> <laughs> Who just it. got her degree that's uh, right. uh, last week. Yes. Uh, the master's. The master's degree. Uh, I'll just make a few comments about uh, the recall. Uh, the process going forward, uh, uh, people should realize if they don't already, is that the school board will now decide, now that we've certified the election, uh, uh, on whether a special election will be held uh, to replace the three people who've been recalled. Uh, once that decision is made by the school board, then the town council will uh, set the date for a special election if they're called upon to do so. Uh, I can't emphasize the, enough the importance of the election, whether it's a special election or in November. We have five of our seven Board of Education members uh, will be elected this year. Uh, the two people who are remaining are both new. They're six months into their responsibilities as uh, Board of Education members. Institutional knowledge is critical. Uh, if we all thought back to our first months as town council members and what we did not know. Uh, so uh, the importance of this vote cannot be overemphasized. Uh, I did want to thank the community uh, for voting. Uh, the vote was tremendous. There were 4,600, 45, 4,600 people uh, turned out to vote. It's one of the largest special elections we've ever had. And thank you to the town clerk for extending herself and her staff uh, to add an additional early voting day so that we could make that more available uh, to the community. Uh, and, and lastly, strangely, I am, I'm encouraged. Uh, we, on April 25th, had a public hearing that was painful and it was very civil. Uh, mm. People conducted themselves in a very appropriate way. We then had a community that turned out uh, and voted, uh, and uh, no matter how you felt about it, yay or nay, they turned out. Uh, and I thought that was a, a positive step. Uh, these, are, these are hard problems to resolve, uh, and uh, the only way we're going to do it is through civil discourse. Uh, and I think the fact that we had an enthusiastic election. We had a difficult public hearing at which people acted quite appropriately. Those are the kind of signs that I'm looking for and feel are the basis for feeling as if uh, we can move forward as a community. Accept the motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? We are adjourned.